Good morning to one and all present here. First, I thank the Lord God Almighty for this wonderful day. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all for today's webinar titled Environmental Excellence for Excellent Human Living. COVID era is a time which has crippled the whole world. But still, as far as education is concerned, yeah, everywhere hmm? on the entire world, webinars are conducted online to enrich the knowledge of the academic and student community. Today, we have two eminent people to deliver interesting lectures. I wholeheartedly welcome our first speaker for the day, Mr. Bhumi Nathan, who will be talking about wildlife and their habitats in Tamil Nadu. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation, and we are very eager to learn from you, sir. Next, I welcome Dr. Deepak Samuel, who is going to give a lecture on the topic mangrove associated wildlife. Thank you, sir, for your readiness to share your knowledge with us today. Next, we welcome our principal ma'am, Dr. K. Mullai, for her never-ending support and guidance she is rendering to all of us. She is always enthusiastic, encouraging, and motivating us to perform well for the benefit of the students. My hearty welcome goes to the IQSC coordinator, Dr. Mrs. S. Dancy Sophia, and IQSC secretary, Dr. R. Ramya, and Mrs. Kadambri, assistant professor, and head of the Department of Chemistry, for the help rendered throughout the program. A special welcome goes to our team of staff members, faculty members from other institutions from various states who are participating in this webinar and are dear students. The power of education is what binds the nation. Let us join together to contribute to the cause of education. Let us all enrich our knowledge on wildlife today. Stay home, stay safe. Once again, I welcome one and all. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you for your wonderful welcome address. It is the ability to bring out the best in others that makes you a leader. Being a leader is like being a captain of a ship. Now I would like to welcome our beloved principal, Dr. K. Mulai, Associate Professor and Head Department of Zoology to deliver your presidential address. Ma'am, it's over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Kavita. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Yes, ma'am. According to zoology, life is a body. Love is the heart. Stress, stress is the heartbeat, in which joy of life is blood circulation. Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to virtually meet you all here in this pleasant morning during the pandemic. On behalf of the Department of Zoology, I would like to extend a special welcome to our chief guest of honor, Mr. D. Bhuminathan, Landscape Coordinator, WWF India, Coimbatore, and Dr. B. Deepak Samuel, Scientist, National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Chennai, who will be speaking shortly. We are so excited to have you all here to participate in our first webinar of the Department of Zoology. On this special occasion, it's my pleasant duty to talk about the importance of environment, which plays a vital role in the healthy living of human beings. It's matter because of our Earth is the only home that humans have, and it provides a food, and all our essential needs. Humanity's entire life support system depends on the well-being of all the environmental factors. Now, our speakers come here from Coimbatore and Chennai. They are experts in the study of world wildlife and mangrove forests. It's my pleasure to welcome them once again. I hope that today's webinar will throw light upon useful idea about protecting our environment for the present and future generations to come. Thank you once again 
for being here and making the webinar of our college a grand success. Slow the spread of COVID-19, stay home if you can. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, madam. Thank you for your enduring and pleasant presidential address. Now I welcome Mrs. B. Uma Mageshwari, Assistant Professor, to introduce our speaker, Mr. D. Bhumi Nadar. Can I start, Pa? Yes, ma'am. It's over to you. Good morning to everyone being a part of this webinar. I'm D. Uma Maheshwari, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology. I'm here to introduce our speaker of the first session, Dr. D. Bhuminathan, a landscape coordinator, Worldwide Fund for Nature, India. He did his undergraduate in zoology, Government Arts College, Kumbakonam, and post-graduation in wildlife biology, AVC College, Mailadikura. He is doing currently PhD in human elephant conflict in Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. Over the last two decades, he has been working in various parts of Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve, like Kodagu, Nagarhol, National Park, Vayanad, Wildlife Sanctuary, Gudalur Forest Division, Mudumalai Tiger Reserve, Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve, Mukurti National Park, and Koyamathur Forest Division. Main area of work is human elephant conflict, including baseline data collection. He evaluates the effectiveness of conflict mitigation measures, understanding elephant ranging pattern, response to post-translocation of elephant by radio coloring of elephant. He is also working to secure key elephant corridors in the Western Ghats, Neil Green landscape by identifying issues, mitigation follow-up, action with authorities and monitoring elephant movement using camera traps. He co-supervised PG students from Wildlife Biology Division of ABC College and Government Arts College, UTI on various subjects like understanding livestock depredation by large carnivores, status and distribution of four-horned antelope and ecology of sloth bear, Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve and human elephant conflict in Koyamathur and Erode Forest Divisions. Ambition is the path to success. The key to life is accepting challenges. We should be committed. Once we have commitment, you need the discipline and hard work to get you there. Our resource person, Mr. Bhuminathan, accepted our invitation with so much readiness. Learned people are those who help others and those who are ready to share the knowledge and experiences with others. Thank you, sir. Now we will listen to his lecture and learn a lot on wildlife. Today is World International Tigers Day, and I thank our HOD ma'am, Dr. Mullai, for encouraging and arranging this uh, for this webinar on wildlife today. Thank you, Bhuminathan, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. The future of wildlife and the habitat that they depend on is being destroyed. It is time to make nature and all the beauty living within it our priority. We are very lucky to have you as a resource person for the technical session one. Now the technical session one will be taken by Mr. D. Bhuminathan. Sir, it's over to you, sir. Very good morning to uh, everyone, uh, the uh, authorities of this uh, college, uh, um, PKMC Kadalur, and the participants. And it's my pleasure to uh, you know share my uh, experiences uh, over wildlife and uh, the threats in Tamil Nadu. So the subject is um, very vast, you know. So each, each, uh, each and every uh, wildlife species needed a day, you know. So uh, needed a separate session for discussion. But uh, so given this uh, time limits, like uh, I was uh, asked to give about uh, forty-five minutes talk and then 10, 15 minutes of question, question and answers. But uh, more than, uh, you know, now we are far behind the schedule. So I just, uh, whatever, um, so I'm not going to cover the entire, uh, you know, wildlife, uh, uh, you know, including reptiles, amphibians, and insects like that. But I, I can cover whatever key species and, uh, you know, so that, 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 that is the only thing that we can do within the time limits. I have a presentation, which I will just share. And... Um, you can you can keep your questions by end of the session. Yeah. So 
can you all see my uh, you know it's all only pictures though we have a uh, many slides but it's all pictures just i just uh, move on to the slide so can you all see my presentation yes sir you all see my presentation yeah so um, i just um, go to the go to directly to the uh, area that we are uh, you know so south india especially the biodiversity hotspots the western ghats along the you know uh, malabar coast and the um, eastern ghats and the western ghats the area that i just um, highlighted here is the western ghats and mr eastern ghats and you know meeting point in nilgiris and uh, satyamangalam which is a very uh, high biodiversity area and in the entire western ghats that is about 1600 kilometers of uh, you know uh, distance from kanyakumari the tip of kanyakumari to gujarat so there are gaps uh, in uh, you know in goa and uh, palghat which um, you know disconnect the con contiguity of this uh, yet it's a very uh, you know uh, a very large uh, contiguous forested areas and uh, several protected areas and lot of biodiversity and along with this this eastern ghats uh, satyamangalam erod and uh, you know the belur selam hosur all that also added to this uh, you know so it's a very good uh, uh, diversity in tamil nadu and uh, this is the only uh, area which has the largest population of uh, uh, tiger and elephants uh, in the connected habitats so uh, so that is one significance that we have across the country so the entire entire uh, elephant populations in the uh, worldwide so we have uh, more than 50% of the population and uh, of course the tiger also so in the overall tiger population we have 70% of the uh, tiger population in india in which in the southern india where we have this western ghats we have more than 35% of the tiger population so the western ghats also have a, a you know large number of um, mammals birds and uh, reptiles amphibians and um, so coming to the nilgiri biosphere reserve which is a very high uh, biodiversity area and the uh, nilgiri biosphere reserve is the first uh, uh, biosphere reserve declared in uh, india and um, you have a number of uh, uh, protected areas which name is already is given in in each of these polygons that nagarhole bandipur vayanad mudumalai satyamangalam so it is a very connected habitat more than 5500 uh, a uh, square kilometers area which has um, which has more uh, several tiger reserves and a few national parks and lot of forest divisions so all together it is a very good uh, habitats for the wildlife and we have a uh, you know altitudinally it is a very um, you know very wide range we have um, a 3 400 meters of um, uh, altitudinal range where we have very less rainfall and the habitat is very dry when we go to the top uh, you know more than 2000 meter 1500 and 2000 meters uh, in the western ghats uh, it is uh, you know completely shola grasslands you can see the grasslands and the and and then the folds uh, the shoulders you can, you have uh, uh, shola patches and uh, which is which is you know the area where uh, we get all these uh, you know screen starts from here this uh, rivulets and main source of uh, water to the rivers that we have kaveri godavari and the thamarabarani by all uh, the rivers bhavani all the rivers are uh, originating from this uh, western ghats and uh, this is the you know apex forest this climax forest in the western ghats and then coming down and you have a you have a hill tropical forest and uh, dry deciduous and the deciduous forests and um, and then the lower area where we have a rain shadow very less rainfall and uh, there we have a very wide open and uh, very so short trees of uh, uh, thorn forests so this different type of forests and uh, the riverine forests also all together keeps this uh, uh, area which uh, very high in biodiversity and uh, you know different habitats you have a habitat specific uh, 
uh, species. So you, you, if, if you look at this Google Earth uh, map, you can see the undulated forest and you have a valley and then you have rivers and the hilltop. And uh, you know, so, uh, so the, the, the wildlife also, they are very uh, adopted to a different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, state of uh, this uh, habitat. Some of them are uh, the some of the uh, species you don't find uh, in the upper uh, you know regions the the higher elevations and some species which are there in the higher elevations you don't find them in the uh, lower part in the valley and uh, rightly we are in uh, International Tiger Day today and uh, since 2010 uh, this um, the summit Tiger Summit happened in Saint Petersburg. Um, so this uh, International Tiger Day is being observed on 29th uh, July every year, and uh, to mainly to create awareness among the among the communities and uh, stakeholders people. So it's um, because uh, once the population, the tiger population was uh, you know uh, very uh, very high you know, you know in a lag, uh, but uh, today we have uh, in the overall uh, in in, in uh, overall population is very very small. Uh, and in, in India, we have about uh, 3,000 tigers. And um, in that, uh, the southern India where uh, the Western Guards and the Eastern Guards, it is, uh, it is uh, a large stronghold of tiger population in uh, India. So in this, um, uh, you can see how uh, the tiger uh, uh, you know, population is gone down. Uh, if you look at the uh, past, you know, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, 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 you know, sports hunting, uh, people uh, in the in the British period, people used to hunt, uh, and it's like their uh, pride, killing uh, tigers and a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, poisoning of tigers when they are killing their livestock, and uh, when people are being attacked and they are called uh, you know they are declared as many uh, man eaters and they are killed. So a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, stories behind it, and for the decline of the population, the major reason for this decline is the the developments like the fragmentation of their habitats and the disturbances and a lot of hydroelectric projects and dams and roads, linear infrastructures. So altogether, the tiger population went down and they are isolated to the regions. And uh, in 1973, the uh, the project tiger, uh, you know, idea of project tiger came up by the uh, then the prime minister, uh, Madam Indira Gandhi. So the uh, uh, with the nine tiger reserves, uh, the project tiger was started, and then today we have uh, you know exclusively for protecting uh, tigers. There are more than fifty tiger reserves in India, and um, where a special focus is given for uh, tiger for tiger conservation, and the tiger population. Uh, you may wonder how they are uh, you know uh, calculating the tiger numbers. So tigers are having a uh, you know the stripes on their body and which is like the fingerprint that we have individually so both uh, you know the the the, the tiger uh, flank the right and left flank is also not matching they are different so uh, that is one good thing um, which helped to you know uh, identify individuals and uh, the cameras the automated cameras are fixed up across the you know the parts and uh, they are photographed and the photographs are uh, you know matched and then uh, differentiated individuals so like that individual tigers are being uh, you know uh, identified and each tiger reserves the numbers are being given and uh, very recently yesterday the, the report from the government of india the national tiger conservation authority released the report and uh, you can see on the right the 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 impression of this uh, tiger pug mark and the tiger pug mark method was there before this method. The primitive stage, the calculation was done by the pug mark method. So the size of the pug mark is measured to individually identify. But uh, many a times the same tiger when it walks in different, uh, uh, you know, substrate or soil, and uh, it will give a different measurements. And then the uh, we tend to do a overestimation of uh, tiger. So uh, the present method of calculation is very, very, uh, you know, uh, accurate and uh, and individually identified based on their marks. And uh, so the tigers are very, uh, very, uh, they are territorial animals. They have their own territory and they are solitary in nature, unless when they are uh, the mother and cubs, they are, they are together, or they are, when the breeding season, male, female, they will be together. 
otherwise they are very solitary and um, and they will have a territory the territory size will be determined by the the resources available there the prey availability and then the you know the uh, the habitat uh, suitability there water and shade dense everything uh, determines and dictate the, the size of the uh, tiger territory and uh, they have uh, the male male territorial fight will happen and the female to female territorial fight is to happen and um, and uh, you know so the wherever uh, the, the, the tigers are found it indicates that forest is very very healthy you know the tiger uh, presence is indicator of the you know you know good ecosystem and the tigers are are the apex predators so when they are there they 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 should be enough uh, enough uh, uh, food for the tiger like the deer population and the gaur population is good there and then for herbivores if the herbivores should be good there then there should be a good vegetation there so all together the food web is connected and if there is a break anywhere and uh, you don't find the uh, you know the, the the system will be collapse so the tigers are in such a way uh, they are very significant uh, to the uh, forest ecosystem and i will not uh, go into detail unless there is any uh, question at the end so second key species uh, in the landscape uh, is uh, in tamil nadu or uh, in the western ghats is the uh, asian elephant uh, you you see this uh, 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 elephant in the herd there are more uh, you know uh, more uh, more elephants without tusk so the females are not uh, uh, you know having tusk and the only the males having the tusk and uh, in african elephant we have more, more both male female they can, they carry tusk and uh, in asian elephant only the male will have a tusk and um, they will live in group uh, they 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 called as you know elephant herd and they, the few family units join together the the blood bonded family units they join together and they have a Uh, you know uh, large numbers and uh, the males after uh, after the maturity age uh, say about uh, 10 to 15 years of old and the males tend to move out from the uh, family and it will have its own uh, you know uh, its own uh, uh, home range and uh, move out of the family and uh, it will be solitary once it become adult it will be solitary naturally this uh, happens to avoid uh, uh, you know in breeding within the family so that uh, the nature has uh, its own way the males will be moving out of the family but uh, the young males will be associated with the uh, family and uh, you can see a large number of uh, you know group and several families join together there is an adult male and uh, you know very shortly they join and then they move out and then the males although they are uh, you know uh, said solitary sometimes they'll form a bachelor's group like four or five uh, tuskers or the males they join together and uh, some older bulls will be there and they'll they'll be going for uh, going together playing and uh, you know they go for a, a crop rides together and they learn the characters of this uh, you know big bulls within that uh, group and uh, sometimes they do a, a play fight then these fights will have a very uh, helpful in the future when they are meeting each other they will avoid you know the dominant uh, dominancy will be established while they are playing in uh, playing fights and um, uh, you must have heard about uh, the uh, elephant uh, get into musk so the the the, the fluid that um, uh, oozing out from the uh, gland the temporal gland which is between uh, eye and the ear uh, it is called the musk gland and there is a hole and the whole secretes the fluids and the fluids will have a strong odor and this is a kind of chemical communication to the other individuals in the same area so the male elephants uh, uh, will get into musk uh, if they are in good physique uh, every year this musk phenomena will be happening in the same season almost in the same period uh, you know so this musk is like uh, uh, you know it will be very uh, when the animal is in good uh, physic and good body condition so the must uh, will come and this is the time when they are very much uh, you know go for uh, uh, breeding and it's a kind of breeding time and uh, they will be uh, ranging a lot 
when there is uh, no mass it will be using a smaller area but when they are getting into mass they will be ranging a lot and they will be going after uh, you know in search of uh, a suitable females and that's how uh, they uh, they slowly they lose out their uh, they will not eat properly drink properly and they will be much aggressive also during this time and the, while they are walking around they will be dribbling urine and uh, they will be rubbing the uh, you know temporal region against the trees and which will be the, the elephants have a very good uh, very good capacity to uh, you know uh, smell rather uh, vision so this uh, smelling capacity is very high so the elephants will be easily picking up smells if they are going to the forest if so if the wind goes from from us to the elephant easily they know that uh, the presence of our uh, you know uh, so they will be uh, charging towards us or it will be running away from the place so you can see a um, the range map of the uh, must and non must the red color uh, shows this uh, non must period very small area the the blue color uh, the the blue dots are the during the must range they are wandering very lot so a male elephant requires more than 300 uh, square kilometers of area whereas this um, the female herds requires more than 600 square kilometers of area so very huge Uh, so in that case uh, when we are focusing a conservation uh, program for elephant and tigers the key species uh, so every other animals within that uh, uh, you know habitat will be protected because uh, although we say that it's elephant conservation and tiger conservation it indirectly means all the other wildlife because people keep asking uh, why only for elephant and why only people are focusing on tigers not the other uh, wildlife so it is not like that so when you are protecting elephants that means you you need to have a very connected habitat very large area need to be protected and all the other wildlife are the much smaller home ranges and they will be uh, easily protected within that uh, uh, habitat so when you look at the elephant in a agitative mood or aggressive mood so then you will see uh, the elephants once uh, uh, if you are traveling through the forest or if you are uh, if you are, if our uh, smells are been captured by the elephant and immediately it will be like uh, uh, become straight ear uh, ear uh, otherwise generally the elephants will ear fanning action will be there suddenly the ear become straight and it will not uh, it will not sway its tail and it will just uh, and it will make uh, you know no sound also the communications will be there and then it will kick the kick the ground and finally it will charge and most of the times the elephant uh, do a mock charge but uh, we cannot uh, we cannot predict to which will be the mock charge and which will be the real charge so but uh, we should be very careful when uh, you know approaching or when we are going through the forest when we see animal in agitative mode elephants uh, you see very Uh, 3000 4000 kilos of weight and we think that they will not run fast but they will immediately they will start 40 50 km speeds it will be uh, you know coming and uh, it will uh, if we are uh, going beyond the, the critical distance then they will uh, tend to charge so we should avoid uh, avoid that close to the uh, uh, animals if we are uh, happen to be in the uh, forest area and especially when the animal with the calf young ones they will be very uh, you know uh, aggressive because the they see the any uh, this thing predators and uh, so they see the threat to the young ones so they will be very uh, you know aggressive and then uh, so the tusk itself the males are carrying tusk the tusk itself the biggest threat for the um, elephants so the elephants are being killed for the male elephants are being killed for the ivories ivory poaching is very big in this uh, you know wildlife trafficking and uh, that's where the the ratio of male female in the population is very skewed the males are very less in the population so they are uh, they are brutally killed uh, in uh, in uh, by the poachers and of of late a lot of uh, you know uh, enforcement agencies and lot of anti poaching activities keeping this uh, you know the uh, the elephants in in uh, the ivory poaching in control and yet uh, we cannot say that it's completely been you know uh, completely 
stopped and there are there are coaching happening organized coaching and uh, opportunistic coaching it's all happening and uh, it's such a large tuskers uh, seeing large tuskers in the in the population is very very less uh, because uh, most of these older bulls uh, you know so were 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 killed for their ivories in the past and in the recent years now we are seeing such a large bulls uh, so that itself uh, giving some indication that the good uh, you know uh, protection is uh, around uh, there in the telephone habitats so you can see the forest and development and almost to the entire the uh, suitable habitats for wildlife and the flat terrains are being uh, you know completely carved out for the human use and only the hilly terrains are left uh, the only you can see the forest boundary is only following the contour lines so how uh, shall we expect the uh, you know wildlife is not uh, coming into a uh, conflict because they cannot negotiate such a steep hillocks and they have to cross through these valleys to reach one end to the another end and uh, that is how so why i am going to because i just wanted to give emphasis for a couple of species and then i'll just go through the other species just by telling few uh, you know things so elephant since i am uh, i am uh, you know a long time i've been uh, were studying this so i wanted to give more details on this so and the crop rights happens as they are coming into the uh, you know human use areas and the crop rights are expect expected and uh, you know then the barriers so the elephants um, have the anatomy like they cannot jump like an uh, you know deer or uh, other uh, animal or tiger so they there will be a trench will be uh, for, you know constructed along the uh, interface between, between forest and uh, you know human use areas and so that the elephant cannot uh, cross the trench so that uh, 2 meter depth and then 3 meter uh, top width and 1 meter bottom width is the dimension sometimes this uh, you know the uh, the difficulty is also there and the poor constructions uh, because of the rocky rocky surface rocky ground and the proper dimension is not taken so the elephants keep uh, uh, you know negotiating such uh, barriers and you can see the other photograph the elephant is breaking the electric fence so the electric fence is designed in such a way that it will not kill the elephant but it will give a shock but for the the the, the male elephants they use the tusk to break the uh, you know the the electric fence because the tusks are non conductive so the uh, so easily it will so they learn how to overcome such barriers and sometimes this uh, elephants the conflict elephants are being captured by the uh, by the forest department for translocate to one place to another place and sometimes they take it to the uh, elephant camp for captivity and domesticate and uh, such uh, situations uh, we call these kunki elephants you see the elephants on both sides the larger elephants they are uh, they are kunki elephants well trained and they obey for commands and uh, they are uh, used for uh, capturing uh, you know uh, elephants while uh, supporting during the capture operations and sometimes they are brought to the area where the problematic uh, situations to drive the elephants or guide the elephants to the forested areas and uh, so most of the times in the past the elephants were just uh, been uh, caught and then they translocated to the areas without any Uh, monitoring monitoring you know um, uh, uh, techniques they, they 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 always say uh, you know uh, the successful operations but we don't know whether the elephants uh, are accommodated to the area or the new uh, locations and uh, are the elephant come back or they are in conflict but in the but in first time in the 2010 uh, the gps collar was fixed and then uh, one of the elephant which was translocated 200 km down south from this uh, asan district in karnataka and was tracked and then after 6 months of time the elephant uh, slowly uh, you know uh, uh, got the sense of the direction and got back to the car location where they was so another elephant which was translocated from coimbatore to mudumalai and it didn't come back it settled there and uh, you know uh, and uh, and the conflict was there and uh, and uh, but most of the times you can see its time spent was inside the forest so the, it is a mixture of uh, uh, so you can't say the translocation is not uh, you know uh, uh, successful or failure 
and the number of individuals that we have done is very very minimal and uh, in in such case uh, so uh, we can't say that uh, uh, any conclusion now so actually it's a mixture of uh, mixture of uh, results have been achieved from this but in the future the way in the the way the fragmentation is happening in future the meta population management is very much uh, needed in the in the future in such situations now now itself we should be uh, looking that the options how and we have to learn lessons from uh, you know the current uh, situations so the another key species in the landscape is this uh, uh, nilgirita nilgirita is uh, called in tamil varayadu so this uh, nilgirita and the himalayan tar uh, is the two tar in the indian uh, india india uh, in uh, himalayan tar is in himalaya nilgirita is in the uh, western ghats uh, from nilgiris to kanyakumari it's not found in their uh, western ghats but their population is very very small something more than 3000 individuals are left in the uh, forest now and uh, a few a few national parks are you know uh, really having a large number of uh, uh, the nilgiri tar like mukurthi national park in the nilgiri and then the uh, grass hills national park in the anomalies and then iravikulam national park in munnar area so these are areas with a large population but uh, their their population is also been isolated due to a lot of developmental activities and you know uh, and lot of uh, lot of fragmentations and uh, and also you can see if you someone uh, from you if you had traveled to walpara area from polachi you could see that uh, tar is on the road so tar is supposed to be very shy animal and it will be in the very very higher elevated areas and in the cliff uh, terrain and they will be immediately uh, escape into the cliff areas where one cannot go even predators are uh, not able to uh, catch them easily so in the such uh, animals are now coming to the road because the road is uh, the, the, the the tar is not coming to the road actually the road is going inside the tar habitats they are just uh, so the more and more infrastructure linear infrastructure and things like that and then lot of uh, forest degradation the number of exotic species which were introduced from mm -hmm. different countries and they are all catching up the original habitat of nilgiri tar so nilgiri tar is the state animal of tamil nadu also so and uh, the state bird is uh, the asian emerald dove and the palmyra tree is the state tree and the uh, tamil yamun or called the tamil maravan is the butterfly of tamil nadu glorisa the singandal flower is the uh, state flower and um, so coming to uh, another uh, you know predators Uh, in the large cat uh, is leopard so the leopards also been uh, leopards uh, is a very nocturnal animal and they are very adapted to even uh, you know disturbed areas and they'll come to and uh, they'll survive even close to the human habitations and they prey upon the livestock and uh, you know so um, the leopards are being separated individually by their rosette pattern the dots you can see it's called the rosettes and the rosette patterns are used to individually differentiate uh, uh, the the leopards and uh, you can also see uh, the 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 black panther uh, and that is uh, just uh, you know the uh, higher amount of uh, the the pigments uh, you know uh, secretion of the pigments that is um, uh, melanism it's called melanism and often you uh, see a picture from kabini area that black panther and sometimes from the anomaly tiger so in nilgiris also we found in the camera trophy so the leopards are uh, also leopards and tigers they are adjust each other within the same habitat where you have a good population of tiger you also have a good population of uh, leopards and uh, they uh, prey upon uh, you know the wild pigs and spotted deer and smaller animals and um, sometimes they'll take the prey and uh, put it on the tree branches you know climb the tree with the prey very effectively and very uh, you know strong animal and to uh, so that the other other competitors uh, uh, you know it can be protected the, the prey can be protected from the other competitors so the carcass will be put up on the uh, trees and um, and uh, the striped hyena it is a, it is a scavenger and a very habitat specific animal and this is uh, found only in the 
drier habitats uh, you can see in tamil nadu where um, the the in the satyamangalam tiger reserve uh, where uh, the bhavani sagar uh, range and then if you go to uh, nilgiris in the in the eastern part of uh, the masinagudi and uh, the sigur plateau and uh, some bit of uh, the karnataka side in the bandipur so drier area and uh, where uh, they will be uh, found and very um, you know uh, rocky areas for, uh, for hiding themselves in the dens so such suitable areas and uh, we found uh, hyenas but the hyena numbers are not very high in the overall area where we have covered not more than 30 40 individuals of uh, hyena and the hyenas also the striped the hyenas also been separated individually by their stripe marks you can see the stripes on their body so the left and right uh, stripe marks will be different it's all like a fingerprint and uh, coming to the herbivores the large herbivores uh, is uh, you know the indian gaur uh, in tamil we call the kaattu maadu and uh, they live in a large groups and uh, and uh, they are found uh, in the drier areas and they are found in the sorry they are found in the uh, you know higher elevations in the in the in all type of habitat and often it is reported that you know from the hill stations like erkad and kodaikanal and uh, you know from nilgiris uh, from the tea plantations and all that and the conflict with uh, uh, the indian gaur because their habitats are uh, you know very much uh, Uh, you know uh, being converted into a coffee plantations and tea plantations mostly tea plantations so, so they are continue to use such areas and uh, their habitats are fragmented and the conflict is expected there and uh, you know there are uh, plantations which are not been maintained and they are using and uh, and sometimes they are uh, the, the, the attack on human also reported and uh, they are very uh, they are very uh, uh, you know a uh, large in uh, the, the bulls are very very large and very shiny black and they will be solitary sometime and uh, the the only uh, predator the tiger can uh, prey on this uh, uh, you know the gaur and now because of this altered habitat and then the areas where they were uh, uh, originally these are areas become now uh, human use areas plantation so they are very much coming with the people now and uh, another um, you know large prey for tiger is uh, the sambar deer in tamil it's called mila or kadamon and uh, so you can see only the the males uh, have the antler so it's not a true horn so the antler will uh, shed off uh, once after the uh, breeding season every year and uh, so you you see the they are uh, they are large in numbers and uh, and sometimes you find them two three single uh, also and they are also found across all variety of habitats and you find them in the higher elevations and you also find them in the arid you know very uh, dry storm areas and then the in our landscape the, the cheetal the spotted deer uh, is very very high in numbers in uh, in density and where we have a good population of tigers you have a good uh, numbers of uh, you know uh, prey that is the cheetal spotted deer and the spotted deer also the male have the antler and the female you can separate the male female uh, by uh, antler uh, presence of antler so the antler uh, you can see one of these antler in the in the down below in the picture is uh, you know very sponge type which, which is called a velvet horn and uh, the velvet horn and the once grown fully the the you know uh, the 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 blood circulation will cut off and then the the uh, horn will be the the antler will be shed off this uh, skins and after the breeding season the antler will uh, fall fall off so then the, these are uh, you know uh, black buck uh, you can uh, you you know well that uh, case of uh, salman khan case the black buck issue and here uh, the males only carry the uh, uh, you know horn it's a true horn the spiral horn you see and this is a uh, but uh, they are also very habitat specific and you find in very open and uh, open habitat and a very dry area and uh, we have the uh, black buck in point kalima and giddy national park and uh, good numbers in the in the satyamangalam nilgiris also in the drier part 
and uh, they uh, while they're running they run you know like all four legs at a time it will be trotting like um, you know uh, they, they they run very fast and uh, and when they see any threat and they'll immediately uh, started running in fast uh, mode and uh, sometimes when because because they are very very less in numbers they join with the cheetal herd and to you know avoid uh, so predation probability and uh, then the the photograph on the left is the four horn antelope and four horn antelope they are very habitat specific and territorial animal and um, it is it is found mostly in the in the slope hill tropical forests and in the dry deciduous forests and even the dry thorn forests and um, and uh, this will be in three four uh, in numbers and sometimes solitary and it has a habit of coming to a same place where the common uh, you know defecation site where it will be defecating pellets there and uh, even if we don't find the directly see poor on antelope so the such a, such a defecation sites indicates the presence of the uh, poor on antelope and uh, they are very very less in numbers and then the barking deer the barking deers are uh, uh, you know found in wide range of uh, habitat except in the drier uh, belt and uh, and uh, they are they are uh, very very solitary in nature unless if there is a uh, young ones also associated with it and uh, so these are the herbivores larger herbivores and the black naped hare is a very small uh, uh, you know animal the moyel and they are very uh, everywhere people are hunting the uh, you know the black naped hare using the snares a series of uh, wires are uh, Uh, made up of uh, wires uh, used for snaring the animal and people uh, you know uh, uh, several cases of uh, black nape the hare during this pandemic situation in many forested areas because the black nape the hare not only in the forest they are also living outside the forest areas in the human use areas even the small bushes in the fallow lands they are very large in numbers and they are being caught and killed for meat and the primates uh, there are uh, there are different uh, primate species are there we have a lion tail macaque which is the endemic uh, uh, species for the western ghats and uh, you see the, uh, the lion tail macaque on the left and they are uh, found in the higher elevated areas and um, and they are uh, they are also in the in the threat now because the fragmentations and uh, if you are walking uh, if you are going to the Uh, going to Valpara, you can see the Nature Conservation Foundation has uh, done excellent work on the connecting the canopies through bridging. You know, so their connectivities are lost, and they are coming to the road, and they are killed in the trucks. You know, so the vehicle passing through, they are killing them, and uh, so uh, now the bridges are being used. Uh, um, the lion tail macaques, and they are only in pockets. they are not everywhere they are in pockets in the south in in megamalays and you know anamalays and some part of nilgiris and their population is also only over around 3000 plus in the western ghats and on the right you see the uh, the nilgiri langur the nilgiri langur is uh, also uh, black in color and uh, you know so they are found in the uh, in the nilgiris and other parts of the uh, western ghats and they are very social animal they have a they live in uh, in large in groups uh, you can see this group of uh, common langur on the left the black face and uh, white uh, uh, body with a long tail and curved long tail and uh, so common langur is found in in all the habitats like you find them in the lower uh, elevation in the dry part, drier part of the habitat and you find them in the higher elevations also Uh, and uh, and then the bonnet macaque on the right the the uh, not to kurang you see everywhere and then the slender loris slender loris uh, is very uh, you know drier uh, habitat is and they are very arboreal uh, animal and um, and uh, so so they are found a lot in dindukal uh, uh, region and then uh, when come to uh, look at the sloth bear and the sloth bears are there everywhere and um, often you uh, see uh, uh, read the messages that uh, sloth bear attacked people and um, uh, in nilgiris and uh, other parts and recently in kmtr one of the uh, rescued uh, uh, 
you know, Slotber was uh, released and it, it, it attacked the couple of uh, doctors there when they were released. So people, when they are going to the forest, even the indigenous people, the communities living in, in the forest areas, they are very much, uh, you know, afraid of uh, sloth bear. I have seen people, uh, you know, being attacked by sloth bear uh, and completely the head has been, uh, you know, completely scraped and then very deep injuries. And, uh, you know, uh, it will disfigure the people by its attacks, you know, uh, very powerful class. But it's, you know, so it's a good thing is like, uh, they feed on fruits and a lot of fruits uh, during the fruiting season and they disperse the uh, seeds in large numbers in different parts and they are very good climber and if you are walking along the riverside and uh, the huge trees like uh, the near marudu trees uh, you can see the nail marks the claw marks of the uh, sloth bear and uh, it will go up and eat the honey and you know the honey combs are there and they'll eat the honey and it's an omnivorous species. It eats everything. Like it eats termites, insects, honey, and it feeds on the fruits, everything. And it will stand up on two legs and, you know, hold the tree and it will eat the fruit. And you can see the young ones also being put up on the back and it's going when they are going out. And slowly they'll become, they'll learn from the mother. And on the right, what you see is the honey badger and very few in numbers and only in Satyamangalam we found uh, and in Karnataka part there are uh, good numbers in Kaveri and uh, Emma Mills, this Malay Madheswaran uh, wildlife sanctuary areas and it is also again omnivorous uh, animal and uh, and not much understood, very lesser uh, known species and um, then the uh, wild dog, wild dog they uh, you know they live in pack and uh, you know uh, two, three, and then they'll be 15, 20 also. And they they hunt the animal, you know, uh, lively, like when the, they chase the animal, sometimes they chase the animal into the water and corner them and, uh, you know, and um, from different directions, the individuals will attack. And the very cruel uh, attack, uh, if you happen to see some YouTube on, uh, you know, in the Google, if you see the uh, feeding habits of the, the uh, Wild dog, and uh, it will completely finish in 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 few hours of time. Yeah, deer uh, meat will be completely eaten. Only the bones are left, and such a uh, very uh, powerful uh, animal. And um, and they are found in the upper upper in the upper uh, reaches uh, in the higher elevation, and they are also found in the in the dry habitat like this, and the wide range of uh, distribution for for the uh, wild dog. And the jackal. Coming to jackal, uh, jackal population was very good in some point of time in the past. Where, so you uh, must be hearing, uh, heard this, you must have heard this howling sound of jackal from this village limits and then from the agricultural areas. But these days, the jackal population is very, very, you know, um, uh, very, very low. And the jackals are, were also poached largely, uh, you know, for, uh, for, uh, Simply, they people say nari kombu and all that, and uh, but the jackals are uh, you know largely disappeared. And in uh, overall our uh, monitoring in the landscape, wildlife monitoring studies in the landscape, and we found only few pictures uh, from the from the you know lower uh, lower area. And uh, in the upper reaches, uh, we found a uh, good number, uh, like uh, the Nilgiri's uh, upper plateau. So uh, sorry. I just see what is the time now. So, so I think I am uh, taking more time. So I'll just quickly uh, finish it off. So small carnivores are la la there, like um, uh, you know the mongoose and all that. Then the Nilgiri Martin is very very specific, and they are endemic to these uh, uh, Western Ghats. And you uh, see the Indian pangolin. Indian pangolin is one of the highly wildlife tracking uh, trafficking uh, animal for their scales, and often you found. Uh, the people are caught and, uh, you know, they seize the uh, pangolin and they are very, very uh, in danger situation. And uh, there are uh, there are 23 endemic species in the Western Ghats of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, 519 species in the Tamil Nadu, the birds. And a lot of, um, you know, the uh, coming to vulture, vulture, there are four species of vultures in Tamil Nadu, white-backed, long-billed, and red-headed vulture and the Egyptian vultures. 
and these vultures are uh, you know also connected with um, the carnivores like tigers when there is a tiger so then the tiger kills and uh, the vultures will feed on them and uh, you know tiger will not eat everything completely and they feed and then go so the, the sharing system is there within the ecosystem but they are very much affected once they were in large numbers and now they are very very you know uh, 99 percentage of their population is wiped out from the country what we have is only very uh, limited numbers and the southernmost breeding population of uh, vultures is in our tamil nadu the nilgiris and uh, the satyamangalam areas and uh, the 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 a pain killer which was used for the uh, for the cattle populations called diclofenac was one single uh, major re you know reason for decline of this uh, you know the vulture population and um, you know butterflies you know uh, their their role is very very important uh, for for uh, for uh, you know uh, so uh, there are 334 species are there in western ghats and 325 species are there in tamil nadu and they are very very important for pollinations and there are a few you know uh, butterfly parks are there which is in uh, tiruchirappalli srirangam is one of the uh, classic uh, butterfly park and we have a uh, crocodiles in these rivers in uh, magar crocodile and um, so mainly the issues i come to issues this connectivity is the main issues corridors are needed and the rapid uh, land use changes are affected the movements of uh, wildlife and the natural features deep valley and uh, you know steep mountains are uh, are uh, funneling the animal through a narrow corridors and those corridors should be protected for um, you know connecting the large populations you see the, uh, the the situation how you know wildlife habitats are ripped upon like uh, they are broken through linear infrastructures and they are also been killed in uh, you know accidents and uh, you know so these are the situations uh, then the forest fire is uh, very very uh, you know uh, pathetic in summer season uh, so none of these forest fires are natural all man man made forest fire and they are killing the forest and uh, you know young plants and uh, young and then the uh, you know birds and smaller animals and uh, then the people are snaring you know so they snare for some wild pig or something and uh, and uh, you know a lot of other non targeted animals are also been killed and the uh, single largest issue for uh, for uh, elephant conservation is also electrocution so the people uh, sometimes they connect the wires directly to the mains and often these uh, you know elephants are being killed in electrocution and uh, on top of all the habitat degradation is also due to the invasive alien species there are invasive alien species which degrade the forest and the native vegetations are suppressed and the invasive species are spread across and uh, the herbivores are finding problem and uh, naturally the carnivores also affected so with this uh, i just uh, conclude now and uh, apart from wildlife there are a number of uh, indigenous people uh, living inside the forest without them the conservation is not possible and their support is very very important and often we have a dialogue with them and we have a team working with this uh, uh, communities and their cultural and you know their livelihood aspects and with that only all this conservation should be uh, possible and with that i conclude my presentations uh, thank you for uh, this uh, you know patiently uh, listen to my talk and uh, if there is any question maybe now or after deepak sir's presentations i would take thank you thank you so much i'll stop sharing thank you sir it seems everything in nature that has beauty also has a price let the value of our planet's wildlife be to nature and nature alone yes sir we really enjoyed your session which is informative and thought provoking thank you sir now the participants are requested to post your question in your chat box this is time for the discussion
Yeah, Papa. You can ask the questions, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Luminathan, sir. Yes, good morning, madam. Sir, I have a few questions from the participants, students, sir. Yes. The first question is from Siva Parvati of Second Year Zoology. How do you find out the habitats of animals in a wildlife reserve, sir? So the habitats how, of pardon? animals. Animals. How are the? How do you find out the habitats of animals in a wildlife reserve? Okay, so the so uh, we have a uh, you know range of uh, wildlife and different habits. Uh, so the, so the, some of them are nocturnal and some of them are diurnal, and uh, some animals are very elusive. We cannot uh, see them, and uh, you know. Uh, for uh, for uh, animals like uh, you know tiger and uh, you know uh, leopards we we fix the camera traps in the forest and then we uh, we entire area will be covered uh, systematically the area will be divided into a grids and each uh, grids will have a uh, you know camera traps and then uh, we will uh, arrive after one month of uh, uh, you know monitoring we will look at the data and see uh, so which habitats and which wildlife and the distribution of different species will be arrived at and then the numbers also arrived at but for uh, for uh, the elephants it's all you can uh, you can do a, a daytime uh, you know visits and then take photographs and uh, observations and the elephants also individually identified by their tusk pattern and then the tail uh, brush and then tail length and the ear ear folds, ear folds, and the ear notches, and then ear margin, all that will be used. So uh, animals, um, uh, you know, the habitat will be studied. Some direct observation for the nocturnal, di diurnal animal, and then for and then the indirect uh, indirect uh, methods also used. Suppose um, uh, the, some animals are very low in number, we will not be able to see, but their uh, their, their tracks and their uh, you know, uh, the scat or pellets will be used to know which habitats they are living in. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. It was a very good explanation, sir. We didn't know about all these things. We just know elephants. That's also there are so many minute details are there. The second question is from Super Sri Third Year Zoology. Which is the animal seen in most numbers in Tamil Nadu forest reserves? Which is the animal in most numbers? Yeah, right? most numbers. Yeah, sir. So most numbers, I would say, um, the the spotted deers are uh, you know very good numbers. I mean, the the, the mammals, larger mammals, but uh, I'm not going into deeper into the smaller animals. But if you look at uh, the um, uh, larger uh, mammals, so uh, the spotted deers are uh, uh, having uh, large numbers in different forests we have. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. The next question is from Priya Deshni, second year zoology. In what way wildlife habitats are connected with environmental concerns, sir? Habitats are uh, habitats are uh, you know uh, how they are uh, for the environment. Uh, environment is uh, is this uh, forest conservation is environmental uh, uh, conservation. So for your uh, your climate change or whatever uh, we say, uh, growing of trees and the plantations. So all that is uh, you know very very closely connected. So the habitats uh, should be conserved. So the habitat for for habitat conservation and uh, the wildlife without wildlife, uh, the habitats are not being uh, you know they will not be uh, conserved. So the habitats and wildlife and environmental uh, are closely linked to each other. Related mm -hmm. to each other. Okay, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for a very good, excellent uh, presentation. It was like really going to the forest and seeing all the animals like this, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Yes. So hope no other questions, no, madam? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Next, there is a yes. question from Aswin Pradeep. Okay. 
uh, what are the reasonable and practical alternative for electric fencing for reducing elephant death? Yeah, actually this, uh, you know, um, the uh, awareness is very, very important for, uh, for uh, a safe uh, method of fencing. The illegal uh, electric fencing is, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to put a very fancy model and invest more money just to connect with these uh, main wires. And sometimes we found, uh, you know, because of this poor awareness, uh, the farmer uh, the, themselves being electrocuted in this uh, situation, not only elephants. So these are not uh, these are not targeted for uh, elephants mainly for wild pig because um, the crop rights by uh, by wild pig is even more than the elephants. And when they are coming to crop right and uh, the wild pigs are easily being killed by electrocution. And recently you must have heard an elephant in. Uh, Kerala, where the explosive burst inside the mouth, and that that type of method also being used for the wild pig, the killing wild pig. But I'm not saying this, and uh, it, it should it can be used for wild pig. But in general, uh, the safe fencing, uh, you know, awareness is to be given, and the frequent uh, frequent you know patrols in the in the village uh, village in the village bordering the forest areas to be done by the electricity board and forest department to find out the such uh, such you know uh, illegal fences and give them give them you know awareness for safe uh, electric fences thank you sir what are steps taken by government to reduce infrastructure so infrastructures are more and more coming up like uh, we have uh, although there is a state uh, Wildlife Advisory Board, National uh, Wildlife Advisory Board, and there are checks. Uh, uh, the NOC uh, should be given by these boards, but uh, but uh, you know it's all uh, uh, it's all coming up uh, more and more. Uh, uh, infrastructures are coming, and uh, one side the developments of the country, but uh, what we see like um, the wildlife friendly infrastructures are are always you know it, it can be. It can be uh, done. Like uh, you have a, a road going through the forest, and there is no mitigation for that. There is a there is a corridor which is called Kalar uh, in the Coimbatore division, which is connecting major habitats of the elephant. And we have been asking for a uh, for a flyover of about uh, about uh, two kilometer length flyover to elevate the traffic and uh, to have a safe movement of elephants. This is not happening. But uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, kilometers of roads and infrastructures are coming. I don't know so how uh, this uh, has, has to be checked in. Thank you, sir. How is WWF related to IUCN? So the WWF and IUCN, like IUCN uh, set up this uh, WWF initiative long back for fundraising for wildlife conservation and in different countries and uh, wwf uh, is involved in india also in the beginning that when uh, the project tiger con uh, you know concept was uh, evolved and uh, that time it was also wwf was also very closely supporting all these uh, you know uh, uh, conservation aspects so being normal citizen what of india who are not working as forefront workers in saving wildlife how can we contribute in protecting and reserving our wildlife? So giving more and more, uh, you know, uh, uh, awareness to the people and uh, emphasis the uh, emphasis the forest and wildlife, uh, you know, importance. And if you want to come to a forest areas and see, uh, you can you know participate in the wildlife monitoring exercise when the forest department announces. And you can you can even join there and uh, see see uh, zoology students also can come into this uh, you know wildlife biology uh, subject after uh, after this uh, uh, you know uh, bachelor's degree they can also come into wildlife and uh, they can contribute and common people you know always they they respect wildlife and uh, you know give them give them you know free hand to they they should uh, see that they have rights to live. And when we are going through the forest and we should see that they have rights to cross and we are only in their habitat, we should see that, uh, you know, that discipline should be there. Yeah. 
So there is one more question from uh, Shafina Banuman from Economics Department, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah, she's yes, asking, madam. what is the, how do you feel about the nature of your job, sir? She wants to know, sir. Yeah, actually, see, we uh, we feel very you know happy uh, in uh, you know being in the forested areas and seeing nature and wildlife, you know. So so when when I was choosing this. Uh, the study itself so there were options that uh, uh, you know uh, we can do some uh, research within the within our college campus and uh, there are options uh, we can go to the forest area so i chose to come to mudumalai to see uh, you know look at this uh, my my study was uh, the impact of highway traffic so, so there were several road road mortalities of wildlife uh, by by the vehicle hit so i studied there and then I I I I very much impressed by uh, you know the, looking at the elephants and uh, you know so so it's like um, uh, when uh, somebody will be interested on uh, uh, tigers and somebody will be birds butterflies like that so once you are into it and uh, you cannot be sitting like this in the lockdown in the home you know so you must go there and see them at least once and uh, so what what's happening there so I do that uh, even this time now yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The next question from Dr. M. Jayakumar. How far the new eight-way national highway will affect the biodiversity in Tamil Nadu? See, the, uh, if you look at the Satya Mangalam Tiger Reserve, if you look at Mudumalai Tiger Reserve, these national highways are going through. And, uh, and uh, you know, except a few speed breakers and uh, signboards, so nothing, uh, nothing more uh, can be done, at least uh, in Mudumalai, uh, the night uh, night traffic is closed, so there are uh, there are pressure from the Kerala that to uh, open up the night traffic uh, uh, in the uh, Bandipur side and to connect Mysore, but uh, very high impact. You know, during the uh, during the vehicular movement, a certain species, the sensitive species which will not use the roadside. You know, they will not be coming to the road at all uh, because of the heavy disturbance. And there are places uh, the road, uh, you know, uh, goes parallel to the uh, river, and the wildlife has to cross the road to access the river, and uh, that is where they have a problem, and uh, they are not forced to cross the road, and they are, uh, and uh, the, the 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 although there are several signboards, the vehiculars, uh, the, the the passengers should respect the speed, and they they have to so several road kills also happening. It is not only smaller animals. There were cases of uh, elephants also being killed in the vehicle, you know, accident. So in such situations, and the people are going through the road, and they see that the wild animals are uh, waiting for them to give the food, and they throw food packets and all, and they become habituated, and they all the monkeys all sitting along the roadsides, and then uh, you know at least now because of this lockdown period, so these um, these uh, these wildlife they are properly using the forest areas now. Yeah. Lot of impact by this national highways. So thank you. I think uh, you have another presenters also uh, to present and then, yeah. So Deepak sir must be waiting for, uh, you know, I'm taking more of his time. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, sir. So if there is any sir. time questions, they can they can ask later. Later. Okay, sir. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. The participants yeah, are requested to stay with us. The next technical session two will be going to start in few minutes. Next, I welcome Dr. Mrs. D. Uma Mageswari, Assistant Professor, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. V. Deepak Samuel, for the technical session two. Manage good morning you. good morning sir good morning everybody participating in the webinar the speaker for the second session is dr dv deepak samuel scientist e grade national center for sustainable coastal management ministry of environment forest and climate change chennai dr deepak did his graduation in zoology Excuse me, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you are audible. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. 
Dr. Deepak did his graduation in zoology in Madras Christian College, Chennai, and his post graduation in marine biology and oceanography in Center for Advanced Studies in Marine Biology, Parangi Petai. He did his PhD in marine biology in Tutukurum. From the year 2005 to 2009, he has worked as assistant professor, program specialist, and scientist. He has to his credit numerous significant honors like JRF, SRF scholarships, Young Scientist Award, Best Research Paper Award, Best Poster Award, and many more. He has completed nearly 15 plus research projects. He has published more than 100 research papers and he has given 80 plus invited talks. He has attended more than 45 seminars, symposia, and conferences. He is a member and journal reviewer for many scientific journals. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation. Life is a trial for every human being. Problems are not big. We are too small because we cannot handle them. We should know the power of words. We should always use positive words. Some incidents that happen in our life break us, but still, we have to mold ourselves and become stronger. The speakers whom I introduced and everyone we meet reach the top, not because their parts were made of beds of roses. Everybody has a story of struggle behind their success. Hence, we have to learn from success stories. It is natural that everyone falls, but every time we fall, we have to get up and become still more stronger. I would like to end with a small story. A frog decided to reach the top of a tree. All frogs shouted, it's impossible. It's impossible. Then the frog reached the top. How? Oh, because he was deaf. And he thought everyone was encouraging him to reach the top. Be deaf to negative thoughts if your aim is to reach your goal. Thank you one and all for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Mangroves are important breeding and feeding habitats for both ter ter terrestrial and marine fauna. The mangrove tree trunks, aerial roots, and sediment provide suitable microhabits habitats for colonization of certain wildlife. Sir, now it's over to you. Sir, Deepak sir, Deepak sir, Uma madam. Ma yeah, yeah, he'll join, he'll join, yeah, you're audible, but he'll join. He's told that he'll join within five minutes. Pa.
Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes sir. You are audible. Sir. Yeah. Very sorry. I had to go for an uh, emergency meeting with the director. Uh, there is some uh, issues in Delhi. So we are trying to sort of move office and it's in a different building. So I rushed back and come. Sorry for delay. It's okay, sir. Yeah. So can I start right away? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Is it, is, it is visible? Okay, fine. Okay, uh, first of all, apologies. Uh, unfortunate that I had to, you know, come and join late. Actually, I joined the meeting, but because of this uh, sudden uh, incident that happened in Delhi, we have a lot of uh, protocol procedures to be cleared. Uh, and before I start, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Uma Maheshwari and you know and the entire organizing team uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak and also my friend and colleague uh, <clears throat> Dr. Nirmal Magdil and Dr. Santosh and of course Mr. Bhuminathan who has been <clears throat> very active with the WWF for a long time. Okay, uh, let me start my presentation. Uh, the image that you see at the background is a typical mangrove forest jungle in a place called Bidrakandika in Odisha. So though my title is more on mangrove coastal wildlife, it will be uh, restricting, I will be restricting my mangrove study to uh, Bidrakandika because Bidrakandika is the place where we have done a lot of uh, intervention in terms of uh, ecological uh, modeling and uh, in terms of uh, identifying mangrove zonation and all the associated wildlife flora and fauna. So the topic will be on associated wildlife. Uh, before I uh, start, Talking about the Australian wildlife, I'd like to introduce you to what mangroves are. Uh, these are very specialized and <clears throat> unique plants, and they grow in areas where there is low oxygen. The soil does not have much or sufficient oxygen to as in the terrestrial environment. And uh, you see that there are also uh, slow-moving waters that allow fine sediments to accumulate. So it's a very unique ecosystem, a very unique area where uh, you know the plants are the trees adapted themselves to have roots that come out of water. We call, there are many types of roots like that. We call them pneumatophores, pneumatothoids, root buttresses, and so on. So these are the ones you can see, you know, I'll show some images how they look, and uh, you'll have an idea of uh, how the mangrove plants are. Uh, if we take, for example, in Kadalur, uh, most of your, uh, in OT and <clears throat> NT area, when you drive down the National Highway, you can, State Highway, you can see that, you know, there is a lot of uh, <clears throat> populations of Abyssinia, Marina, uh, very common. A mangrove and a very resilient uh, species that you can see on every side. And also in Pondicherry, you have uh, good plant uh, mangroves in the uh, Tenga Tete area. And also you can see a lot of plantation initiatives by Anamal University in the bridge, the bridge that connects the estuary end parts. <clears throat> okay, so there's a lot of work that has been done on mangroves also. Uh, if you can just imagine or guess the image right in front of you, uh, you see there is a meandering river if you can see my cursor, you can see the river comes and the rivulets come from everywhere. And you can see there's a lot of orangish yellowish vegetation and the green vegetation. The orangish yellowish vegetations are uh, salt marsh vegetation, which are very important in terms of uh, protecting the shore from any kind of erosion. And then you have the mangroves and then you see the <coughs> meandering river entering into the sea. So basically <coughs> a mangrove environment you, is a combination or an interface between Freshwater and marine water. And to understand this, you have to have a look at this image. Because you see that from the terrestrial realm, you see that there's a lot of, you know, water flow and, you know, uh, precipitation and the entire landform of the geological makeup provides a stream or a river or a rivulet to connect and come to the ocean. And when they come, they form the wetland systems. Okay. And wetlands are, uh, there are de many definitions of wetlands. Uh, one definition of wetland is that, you know, any water body, Ramsar, for example, Ramsar Convention tells that any water body, including agriculture land, is considered as a wetland. So, any area that is wetted upon by any kind of water, be it fresh water or brackish water or any other water, it's called as a wetland uh, ecotone or ecosystem, okay? And then you see there is an interface and there is an ecotone form. Ecotones are a combination of 
marine fresh water you know and uh, all of the terrestrial and estuarine and ecology and wetland and so on so this is the uh, this how a combination of uh, terms and everything happens in terms of the uh, mangroves the image that you see in front right now is this particular tree mangrove tree this is called the sundari okay sundari is the name of the tree and uh, this is very famous in west bengal and also in orissa uh, the name of the biggest mangrove forest in the world sundarbans is from this name of this tree okay and this kind of uh, root call them root buttresses okay and this is a very special adapted root and you can see the roots uh, from the bark the roots form a lot of uh, you know uh, protection uh, uh, from erosion so when sand comes they all get trapped and they and they remain there for such a long time okay so this is the sundari plant scientifically it is called heritia formis and it's found basically in the northeastern coast of india and they also support plenty of ecosystems okay and they also give lots of uh, fisheries and uh, they help in nutrient recycling and also in cycling and also in coastal protection and uh, unfortunately we see there is a total reduction okay there's a lot of reduction in terms of you know uh, uh, mangrove uh, cover itself density itself around the world because of development aquaculture and other uh, i mean human or anthropogenic activities so keeping all this in mind we just have to know first what is the status of mangroves again the image that you see is a thick mangrove jungle inside the bitterkanega conservation area in odisha a very well protected <laughs> mangrove environment in the country in fact uh, the density of mangroves there is even better than the ones in sundarbans as mainly because sundarbans there are population living and there is lot of conflict between humans natural environment and animals and uh, whereas here you see that you know uh, mangroves are very thick pristine and well protected because of uh, less human activities and because the forest department has taken a, a very good initiative in kind of protecting it and training the communities to make sure that the uh forest is not disturbed so you see that mangroves are found both on the east and west coast of india including andaman and in lakshadweep we have in two islands in minikoi we have some small patches of mangroves growing it was introduced from the mainland and uh, all but andaman nicobar we have the most pristine okay the undisturbed mangroves in the country comes from andaman nicobar so take it from gujarat coast to west bengal here we have very good mangrove uh, you know present all over the country in almost all the states and even regions in the coast but the diversity of mangroves diversity of mangroves and uh, the kind of you know uh, thickness uh, species diversity associated flora and fauna is very high on the east coast because there are big rivers like ganges and yamuna mahanadi godavari krishna and kaveri so these are the rivers that bring in lot of sedimentation silt and other kind of uh, nutrients required for the mangroves to grow and then we see a good diversity happening okay so uh, you see that muthupet is mentioned tamil nadu pichavar is mentioned of course other places are very very uh, smaller in terms of their distribution so this in comparison between the east coast and west coast though the mangroves present throughout india we see the best mangroves at high species diversity and, and density comes from the east coast of india going on so i am just bringing you some statistics for you uh, you see that uh, in india the maximum number of uh, mangrove coverage besides west bengal is found in gujarat and the andaman nicobar gujarat there is a very high mangrove cover but unfortunately species is only 3 or 4 whereas if andaman nicobar 12.39% is there there are more than 25 species whereas sundarbans has got close to 35 species and you know so basically it is not on based of the the percentage does not uh, you know give a clear idea about the species diversity it gives a more total mangrove cover so this is the current status of mangroves in the country this is india state of forest report okay right and uh, we also see that there is an increase in the square kilometer of mangrove cover area and uh, you see that gujarat has got the maximum cover whereas uh, 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 you know we see that uh, you know uh, uh, there was uh, the, there was a lot of mangroves that was lost because of the plantation initiative by different states we see that there are a lot of mangroves present in the state of gujarat going on from there uh, this is the categories the forest survey of india uses to classify mangroves we call them very dense mangroves moderately dense mangroves or open mangroves based on the canopy which means the entire uh, uh, you know the the, the the density of the mangrove foliage cover based on that it is done and also 
health transits are done to see the health of the members. And uh, you can see the overall, this is a 2019 report for FSI. This is how it is in, the, in, in, uh, in India overall. And you see that uh, we have only, worry, only one very dense patch of mangroves, Tamil Nadu. And uh, that's again in the area. And uh, these are different types of uh, mangroves available, okay? Throughout the country, and this is the status of Tamil Nadu. And uh, minus four shows a warning that there is a reduction in the number of mangrove uh, uh, the distribution or spread in the last two years. So if you take a pie chart, for example, and stay, identify the number of mangroves present, you see that West Bengal has got the maximum, followed by Gujarat, and then you have uh, Andaman Nicobar, Andhra Pradesh and Damandi together and Karnataka. So this is the general distribution. Tamil Nadu is featuring here with 0.9% of mangroves in the country. Okay, so all these were just introduction to you on uh, why mangroves, uh, how mangroves are and uh, why are they important. I will also take you through some more slides why they are important. But uh, before that, you must know the kind of uh, speciations are there. Okay, so you see there are now uh, nine species of mangroves put in front of you. And these are very common and very sturdy species. Acanthus illicifolius, you can see this shrub, it's not a tree, you can see very common. Then you have Aegis corniculatum, Abyssinia, Varena, the species here is the most common one which you find in the east and west coast. And uh, they are very resilient, they can, they have, they've adapted very well to climate change and they're thriving well. And of course, Sonaresh, Exocaria, these all, these all depend, good uh, fresh water also inflow so that they can grow well. What are the ecosystem services we have from mangroves? Okay, there are plenty. Basically, there's something called a steep. The ecosystem uh, ecosystem services uh, for the millennium is a, is, it's a kind of a formula available. So based on that, there are four services, supporting services, provisioning, regulating, cultural. So based on that, you see that fishing, medicine, fuel, honey, these are all products, these are all provisioning services. And then you have regulate, it protects the shore by, uh, through the mangroves, you know, as wall. It improves the water quality, it improves carbon sequestration. In cultural, you see that it's useful for education and research and for tourism. And as supporting services, it gives a lot of support to uh, fish nursing grounds and, you know, and also uh, cycling the nutrients for, uh, you know, kind of uh, the, to enter into the food chain. And as I told you, they play a very important role in carbon sequestration. They act as carbon sinks and carbon assets, blue carbon assets. Uh, we all this while we are telling, studying about only trees in the terrestrial environment that play a very important role as blue carbon assets and blue carbon sinks. But unfortunately, when you compare and see, uh, fortunately, it, you see that you no know, mangrove, seagrass, and salt marsh, they do a better job when compared to terrestrial environment. So this in general about their carbon sequestration potential. And they also protect us from all kind of uh, you know, natural uh, disasters. Uh, they reduce in from wave damage, they they have uh, they they reduce uh, large storms, okay, and uh, they also uh, reduce tsunami damage, reduce erosion. They they check the sea level rise, okay, and uh, these are some of the important uh, uh, I mean services provided by mangroves as such, and uh, these are just uh, uh, a pre preview of uh, why mangroves are very important to be protected and uh, what roles they play and how important they are in terms of different services, provisioning or cultural or you know, uh, any other supporting services that they do. But now we go into the core topic, which is the coastal wildlife. So uh, Bhuminathan sir was explaining very well about starting the elephants. He started to, you know, the, the, the area of his specialization. He started with that and he explained in detail. It was a good learning experience to understand the, the, the herd movement and you know the, the male tuskers, how they behave and uh, other kind of stamping behavior, which was very interesting. And then he moved on to different diversity, right? So I am going to take you into uh, the coastal area, the coastal mangrove forests, which are thick jungles again, uh, which play a very important role for coastal wildlife. So this picture is taken in a place called Habilagatti, uh, where uh, it was uh, after rain. And these are the slush sands, okay? And there's a lot of water available. This is fresh water. Mangroves, uh, the area you see that water is basically brackish or slightly saline because uh, there is a mixture of the seawater into the fresh water and the salt wedges form. But here, in, inside the jungle, there are places like this, or like what we call the rock pools or tidal pools, there are small areas where fresh water is collected and they'll be available for a very short season. And these are very, very important areas because these areas are the areas where the animals come to feed, to drink water. They are called as water holes. There are natural water holes present and there are also a man-made forest department developed water holes present. And uh, this area, the water area is also, uh, it, it's, it teems with a lot of life, okay? 
amphibians, for example, right inside the uh, uh, Bhattarakanika National Park in Odisha, you see there are close to 12 species of frogs identified. But uh, what uh, Herpetofaunus says that there are more species. At the moment, these are the species recorded, 12 species of frogs uh, recorded from the uh, Bhattarakanika uh, National Park area because of protection, because of the you know the uh, the the way it is maintained. We see that you know the 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 entire area is uh, you know blessed with a uh, lot of amphibian fauna, right? And uh, we used to do study for two years, and uh, it was very productive area. Though the water was very murky, you see that the sea water from the river when the water comes very fresh, transparent. When it reaches the sea, a lot of sediments are loaded, and you know you see that the water water is very turbid. So basically, when the water when it comes to the mangrove environment or the, or the mangrove or the backwater area, you see that the water is very brownish or greenish in color. It's high productivity and a lot of sediments. And this is what goes into the ocean. So when they go to the ocean, they are called as fertilizing the ocean because the nutrients, the sediments, and also productivity within that is taken to the ocean where the, the nutrient supplies as fertilizers for the growth of phytoplankton. So these are the phytoplankton that you see in front of your screen. Okay, so these are all collected identified uh, right from Bhattarakanika and you see that there are there are different kinds of diatoms, there are different kinds of dinoflagellates. Probably you have studied in zoology or in you know, aquatic biology about uh, uh, red tides and other harmful algal blooms. So these, the lower one, dinoflagellates, these are responsible for causing the al harmful algal blooms. Whereas the uh, blooms caused by the uh, phytoplankton on top are basically, uh, uh, I mean, not uh, they are not threatening, they are not uh, causing any harm and they play, they are, uh, eaten by in the food chain by different group of zooplankton and other animals. So this is just a bird, bird eye view about uh, what kind of uh, uh, mangroves, you know, uh, mangrove associated phytoplankton and uh, zooplankton are seen. So this is the zooplankton and it's beautiful because uh, almost all the larval forms of, uh, uh, you know, invertebrates and vertebrates are found in the water. You see the images here are all about uh, first A and B is, about, is the larval forms of polychaete worms, which are very important in terms of food which are very important in terms of uh, churning the sediments and then you have foraminiferans in sea and foraminiferans are very important uh, calcium trappers and uh, they form the biogenous ooze on the sediment surface helping in a lot of other animals to live within their you know the gaps and then you have the zoean forms of crab larvae and shrimp larvae so again you see how important because the crabs the shrimps adult and fishes they all come to the estuarine area to uh, you know, lay their eggs. That's why the mangroves are called as nursery grounds or breeding grounds, because there's a lot of food available, a lot of protection available. Uh, you know, because the mangrove leaves when they fall down, they decompose and they give nutrients out of it. And the, the small, small spaces found in between the mangrove decomposed area is the place where they hide. And uh, you see that there is a, a lot of you know uh, interesting stuff that is seen in the uh, uh, zooplankton uh, as zooplankton in the mangrove area of. Uh, okay, so here we also see that there are fish larvae. Okay, these are all small, including a scheduled species fish larvae, right? And uh, uh, this is how a fish larvae looks under the microscope. And uh, when you and also fish eggs, M N M N O, these are all fish eggs. So uh, these again, these are all important from the primary uh, producers. These are the phytoplankton. These phytoplankton are eaten by the zooplankton. Okay, and these on top are the cum jellies, chlorobrachia. And uh, they all feed on the phytoplankton, and that's how. From these are eaten by bigger fishes or bigger invertebrates, and that's how the entire food chain works. So this is how uh, you know how productive in the coastal wildlife is when you compare in a mangrove area. Moving on, here what you see is a, a mating pair of horseshoe crab. Now horseshoe crab are, are not actually crabs. Uh, horseshoe crabs belong to a, a group of arachnids, and arachnids includes scorpions. So, if you this is the dorsal view, if you put the animal ventral on the ventral side, you can see there's a lot of jointed legs because they are arthropods, and they have a very long whip-like tail. Okay, the tail is called telson because the scorpions have a whip-like tail. And similarly, they have a whip-like tail, and that's why they have been uh, classified under the uh, you know the uh, under the coastal wildlife of mangroves. Okay, so uh, here you see that these particular uh, animal is uh, uh, it's an invertebrate and you know it's arthropod and it's an arachnida and this is a living fossil right you would have studied about living fossil in your uh, zoology classes uh, the living fossils are basically you know the nautilus is one cephalopod then you have the coelacanth fish latimeria chalumne latimeria monodensis 
they are again living fossils. Like that, the horseshoe crabs here is also a uh, living fossil. We have only two species in India, and uh, both the species are found only from North Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, and West Bengal, nowhere else in India. On the East Coast, right in front, on north of Northeast Coast, that's the only place you can see them present. And uh, they are commercially exploited, uh, not in India, because in India it is under the Wildlife Protection Act, under Schedule 4 is protected. But whereas in the US, they, are, they take this and extract the blue blood and they use for a lot of anti-cancer studies and release them back to life. Uh, if you see, we, when we had a survey with the Bengali people and Odia people, we found out that uh, these crabs were taken and uh, only very little flesh will be there. That flesh was the entire animal was boiled in water until it becomes like a paste. And that paste was used as a back pain medicine. They call it tail malish in Hindi. Okay, they, they'll apply wherever the pain is, they used to apply. So this is in the traditional medicine with the uh, people. Okay, so, and this is uh, again, a very interesting group of animal which you see uh, present in the Bitrakanika area. Now, if you talk with, say Bitrakanika, the most important animal is the saltwater crocodile. Okay, the saltwater crocodile, scientifically called this crocodile esporosis. And this species is uh, uh, maximum of, uh, you know, the numbers in terms of number is highest found in Bitrakanika where we work. Okay, because this is a protected area and there was a plan, there was a crocodile, uh, a rejuvenation plan that took almost 35 years back when they started with just 100 crocodiles to make sure that their habitat is protected and uh, they are well maintained and you know kept safe because all these crocodiles also in, under the Wildlife Protection Act. But now after protection, 2019 survey of crocodile, we, we were able to, I, I, you know, guess, uh, we were able to estimate there are close to 1,800 species of crocodile present in the area, which means it's a rapid 30 years has given a good uh, result of uh, protection where you see that number of crocodiles have gone up. Okay, now these are the biggest crocodiles available on earth. Um, though they say alligator Mississippi is the Mississippi alligator is the big one. Still, we see that the saltwater crocodile is considered to be the most dangerous and the biggest one. Okay, all other crocodiles live in freshwater, whereas this saltwater crocodile lives in uh, typical backwater area within mangrove jungles, and they're able to uh, survive really well. And uh, what you see here is a female which is sitting on top of her eggs, okay? Now, it is usually a small mound with all the muck. It, you know, develops a mound because when you put, put all this wet uh, vegetation matter, if it's all piled together, you see that there's a lot of humus that generates a lot of, uh, you know, humic condition generates a lot of heat. And uh, this is, again, a good mechanism by which the female can incubate her eggs. They are all cold blood animals, okay? That's why they go they go on the shore and they open their mouth and keep for long times, open the sun. And this phenomenon we call as basking, okay? And basking is a very, very uh, typical term used for crocodiles or some of the reptiles at least. They go and open their mouth. So when they're cold blooded, cold blooded here mean, does not mean that their blood is cold. They have the warm blood, but it's not in uh, like homeostasis as in the case of mammals or higher, higher mammals, okay? So, so you can see this female sitting, arching her body, like, you know, the mound is there. She sits on top like this and uh, with her abdomen part, she presses the nest where the eggs are kept. And again, the clutch again varies 30x, 40x. It depends upon how much it, how she lays, okay? Right. And here you can see very closely a mother guarding her young ones, okay? So you can see small, small crocodile eyes here. So this is a typical mother. And uh, when they are guarding their young ones, they're very aggressive. And, uh, you know, uh, there are times, that, you know, they come out to give you a threatening pose or they come to give you a threatening, uh, you know, snap. They come out just the water, they make a hush sound. Hush, they make a sound and go back to just scare you, which means that there is excellent parental care, okay? Uh, uh, they are able to uh, make sure that the young ones are uh, self-sufficiently able to feed by themselves. But till they are growing, you see that the mother crocodile is with, it stays with them and it makes sure that they are protected. Protected, especially from other male crocodiles, which can kill them, and also from other uh, predators, which you can see a little later, right? And here, this is a very small crocodile. We call it as an yearling, just one year old, okay? And he, he has just, he or she has just caught a, a fish and is trying to eat the fish. Uh, so this is exactly how the area is, very mushy, uh, slush, slushy. If you walk in it, you, up to your knee, it will go inside the soil. And then you can see there's uh, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, what do you call that? There's a lot of uh, uh, sediment, soft sediment present, and you know you get stuck in between. So these are areas which the forest department itself warns people not to venture into or trespass into, because once you get caught, then you have a lot of other predators to come and feed over you. 
So there's a lot of warning given, even in our siting, when we go for sampling and you know, when we do our water quality sampling, when we do the uh, overall biodiversity assessment, we make sure that we took all precautions because we do not know from where the crocodile comes. And as you're aware, crocodiles are excellent predators. They, we do not know from where they come and they're very powerful in the water. They catch the prey, they drag them immediately into the water. That's how it is, okay? So there's a yearling that's uh, feeding on a fish. And here you can see an adult male uh, that's just caught a, a rhesus monkey. Okay, and rhesus monkey is a very common species that you see in Bithrakanika. And uh, you can also see marks, okay? Like the pug marks, what you saw for the tigers there, you have a lot of marks, okay? And uh, this is the combination of both third, uh, the crocodile uh, foot marks and also with uh, maybe, you know, the other uh, uh, cattle. Because sometimes what happens, the villages nearby, the cattle, they just trespass, they come into the forest area and they feed the grass and go back because forest is well protected. But sometimes when, uh, when they are uh, found by the crocodile, then they are dragged under the water and they are killed also. A lot of human deaths also have taken place. Uh, uh, in the main forest area, you see that uh, people are not allowed to go. Uh, even if tourists are allowed, then the forest department officials accompany with you. There are uh, well-trained guides and they'll take you into the forest to, I mean, to show you for a round and come back. So here is a, a classical example of how an adult uh, crocodile is killing an adult or a very old monkey, old monkey, rhesus monkey for its food. And this shows how well the mangrove is well protected, okay? We talk about tiger day today, we talk about tiger conservation. So when we conserve a big animal, a big car top carnivore, then the entire area is protected. So here, the 30 years they were protecting the crocodile very well. And you see that the entire wildlife has grown very well because of the protection mechanism. Here is again a fight between uh, 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 saltwater monitor lizard, okay, or a, a sea uh, or, or a aqua monitor lizard, okay, and with a crocodile. A crocodile, this is the crocodile's upper jaw, it has just caught the uh, the water monitor in its mouth. Uh, I'll show a water monitor, okay, I'll show the wudumbu they call in Tamil, uh, but what the wudumbu we are talking about is Varanas Varanas, whereas the, uh, the particular species I'm talking about is Varanas salt, uh, Varanas salvator, which we'll see in the next image, right? I told you that crocodiles were. They are the very, uh, you know, very powerful predators, and that they were able to, they are able to feed on big mammals and even cows. They, you know, even human beings attack. But here you see that this is a white-bellied sea eagle. It is just carrying a, a small, uh, you know, maybe six months, seven old, months old hatched uh, crocodile baby that's being carried, and you know, it's being it taken, and the sea eagle is going to eat it, right? And it probably is going to give it to a young one, and it's going to, you know, kill it completely. So this, this cycle of life, so the crocodile is the top carnivore, top predator, the epitome, apex uh, animal. Still, you see that there are a uh, cycle of life, you know, it's the, the young ones of it becomes a feed to something else. Even uh, there are cases where you see uh, water monitor litters, uh, water monitor litters, uh, lizards attacking them and killing the uh, young, crocodile, uh, young crocodiles. And there are even uh, small, other smaller, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, fishes that come and attack, uh, fishes come and attack and kill these crocodiles. So this is the uh, water monitor lizard, okay? What you see, the Udumbu, the normal one is gray in color, but this is the water monitor. It's uh, uh, size-wise, both are same, but uh, somehow I feel that the water monitors are slightly bigger and uh, swifter in terms of their movement, though they also live on three. So here is again adult, just walking in the water. And here's a very small one. You know, you can see the difference in the mouth part. Uh, the snout is more broader and bigger for the adult, uh, whereas for the smaller one, the snout is very, elongate and small. So this I this shot I took uh, right in front of the forest guest house where I used to stay regularly. And uh, the water what nearby is the place where the crocodiles come during night times. So we have done some night surveys also, uh, interestingly, right? Uh, but our main objective was not to study on the crocodiles. Our main objective was to study on associated smaller invertebrates, but it gave us an opportunity for us to study the other species also. So this is a water monitor. Of course, the chameleon is found in plenty. This is again in front of our guest house. We took an image. But another interesting thing is the python. Okay, now uh, uh, this is a, this shot was taken by one of my colleague, Dr. Shankar, and this was taken uh, way back in 2019 during uh, April, May. And uh, this, again, you can see the python is hiding in the mangrove root. Right? There's a lot of sufficient pace. Now, this mangrove root, you can ask why there's no water. Okay, certain mangroves are called as front mangroves, certain mangroves called as back mangroves. So in the front mangroves, you see that the, uh, the, you, there, is a, there is always water that's coming in, you know, uh, bathing it regularly and it's exposed. Whereas the back mangroves, you see that 
uh, it is always dry only during the spring tides and nip tides the water comes inside and uh, you know replenishes the area so that there is a lot of exchange now these dried leaves in future will be decomposing and when the fresh water when the water comes inside it takes all the nutrients back to the water fertilizing it okay so this is the it has just had its meal lying down whereas yesterday we got another shot from one more colleague in bitterkanika that it has just got a, a spotted deer and in the mangrove area as you can see the mangrove roots here okay so it's very interesting to see these uh, pythons well adapted to the mangrove basically in, you see in burma in uh, indonesia and southeast asian countries these uh, pythons the burmese python and the reticulated python both of them found to uh, uh, live along the mangroves but uh, in india uh, bitterkanika is one place and even sundarban tara reports that you no know, this pythons are you know found to uh, living found to be living along with the mangrove area so this is again example of a herpetofauna and bitterkanika is also home to one of the biggest population of king cobras okay and uh, this is one shot again taken by another colleague of ours and uh, it's um, very rare to shoot them so close but uh, they had the opportunity to click the image uh, king cobras are found in large numbers in uh, bitterkanika and you know they are also uh keep the population of other snakes in check and also the animals in check so there's no overgrazing this cycle of life you know the nature how it happens when nature takes care of nature by itself then there's a perfect balance when man tries to interfere then you can see there's a lot of breach in the way that nature works okay so this is again a classical example of snake and you can see plenty and plenty and plenty of uh, aquatic birds we call them pelagic birds uh, cases of uh, you know visitors coming from siberia all the way just for you know the winter season stay and then get back and uh, here you can see uh, lots of terns that are only playing about and uh, a signature species of mangrove is the mangrove pitta so what you see is a mangrove pitta uh, two different color variants uh, both in the mangrove area here you see uh, the one of the uh, mangrove pitta bird is trying to take a twig to build its nest and whereas you can see another mangrove pitta bird just sitting down you know uh, waiting for its chance to get a feed or to you know kind of relax a little bit again we have a lot of owls in the jungle i am not very uh, sure of the name of this particular uh, species but uh, this was again shot uh, just about 6 months back when one of our colleagues was in the field and uh, very interestingly it was very close to him so he was able to zoom it better and take a shot of the owl and owls also play very important role in the uh, nocturnal uh, you know uh, feeding and they keep the entire animal ch check during night times so this is the uh, king one species of kingfisher uh, interesting thing in bitterkanika is that there are uh, five species of kingfisher just in one mangrove area okay and this is a good example of sympatric evolution there are parallel like darwin's uh, finches the beaks how they modified themselves for various feeding habitats like this see that there are five types of kingfishers occupying five different heights in the Uh, mangrove areas of uh, bitterkanika and uh, they uh, they play a very important role in you know kind of uh, giving bird dropping nutrients and also feeding the fish populations you know uh, in terms of uh, keeping the population in check so this is a stock billed kingfisher that you see in mangrove area and uh, here is again a, a shot of a kingfisher again a very close up shot you can see how the mangrove vegetation is it's like a very thick jungle it's almost like a rainforest you can see epiphyte growing on top of the box and you know, this becomes an ideal area for excellent wildlife and here we have a, a black headed ibis and uh, this is a very common species this you can find in entire coast of tamil nadu uh, even you can see them in tutukuran in the fish drying yards in the fish drying yards you know wherever the karwad mean they say they'll be drying it you can see them going and pecking on them so they are found in plenty here we have a Heron, which is uh, the uh, large egret, I think it's a cattle egret, or this is not a cattle. This is a uh, another type of uh, darter. I think it's an orange. It's a purple heron. Purple heron. Purple heron. Okay, this is a purple heron, and this is a purple heron, and it's a nest. Now, why I put this image is that uh, this is a Bitterkanika is also a very important place, and there's it's got three big heronaries. So the purple heron uh, it nests very rarely. but then we have other species like the black headed ibis and the open bill stork you can see the young one sitting you know the, all the young ones sitting here and there so this is again a good uh, colony of birds that you see uh, constantly you know kind of visiting they are basically there uh, they are they are not visitors they are residents and they nest in large quantities you can see the black headed ibis you know the young ones all sitting down here so this is again an image of them 
besides we also have many other uh, kingfishers and uh, terns and storks and you know uh, lesser whistling duck these are all uh, from uh, they travel migrate for long play from long distance they come and visit and go so this is again good avifauna and uh, i we uh, updated the checklist with the help of sacon and with other agencies and we found that there are close to 350 plus uh, you know uh, species of uh, birds just uh, documented from vitagenica and this is the uh, the leopard cats okay the baby of leopard it looks like a young uh, kitten but uh, we have two images we have both the fishing cat and the leopard cat uh, available in betraganika so these were the images shared by some colleagues and you know uh, it was very difficult for me to first uh, you know uh, i say because i am marine biology i i know things in water in the terrestrial area i just take information from friends and colleagues so when i found uh, when i asked them like you know it's like a kitten you know they say it's like it's a kitten's family but that's how the leopard cats the fishing cats and the other the, the felis group looks in the uh, mangrove forest area and this is the indian smooth coat otter again this is found to be a very uh, uh, commonly spotted species they are very shy and i have never seen so far i have visited for the last two years maybe six seven times i visited i have never seen in the jungle in the water but uh, our colleagues were in their regular monthly surveys they were able to uh, <coughs> take good pictures and uh, they are very shy as i told and they usually uh, they be in, in families together they go together in you know as a family but you we are able to take a shot of it alone and of course the uh, the golden jackal this is again a very common uh, species that you find uh, in betaganika uh, i have not seen them actively predating but they say that you know they compete the crocodiles they fight with the crocodiles sometimes the crocodile crocodile catches a prey then they also go and fight with them on the shores so these are all stories told by the uh, local people there and also uh, by some of the wildlife biologists who work in that vetrakanik uh, area uh, from jadavpur university in uh, odisha we see a lot of people working from barampur university we have some people working on the animal wildlife and of course we have people from right from avc where uh, bhuminathan sir has studied and uh, from wildlife institute of india and from pnhs there are people uh, visiting regularly to do uh, stock analysis of you know number of species present and so on Okay, this is an interesting species of dolphin. Uh, it's called as Iravadi or Iravadi dolphin, which is very rare. You see it from Orissa, West Bengal, and also there are high population found in Mekong River, so Myanmar, uh, Vietnam towards that area. But uh, in India, we do have a very strong uh, or a good uh, population of uh, Iravadi dolphin. Interestingly, uh, they are very much in the Chilika uh, Lagoon. Chilika is the uh, biggest uh, uh, brackish water lagoon in Asia. okay and uh, and, uh, and uh, we we have second biggest is pulikat in india but uh, chilika is one of the biggest in asia and it's a ramsar site and there they are very well protected there is a good management plan uh, there is also a lot of uh, animal uh, human animal conflict resolution that's happened there is a separate chilika development authority created uh, just to make sure that you know this uh, does not have any problem uh, you know in terms of population because again you know that uh, marine mammals no they they grow they take time to grow they take time to mature and young ones when they are hatched they are maybe they are giving birth there are only one or two at the max okay so it's very difficult to uh, you know kind of uh, uh, protect them and keep them but because of the initiative taken by the chilika development authority we have a very good uh, number of population of uh, 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 iravadi dolphin present in orissa but this interestingly was uh, taken by one of our colleagues in a place called gupti and uh, this is very much interior in the backwater area or into the mangrove area so basically they don't come that far and interestingly we saw that you no know, they were uh, they are there so it shows that they, if there are shoaling fishes then they are found chasing them and feeding on them and they are in groups so <clears throat> here we were able to see one very clear one of course it's a group but we were able to click on one you can see it's just gone and said there's one just coming on top so you know they were able to take a good shot of it so this is a very interesting dolphin that they of course i told about the rhesus monkey this is a very common one in many places outside the protected area you see it is like you know it is a pest uh, it is uh, you know it 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 is kind of will come and take food from you and you know it will when visitors come it will come and go give threatening postures just to take the food from you and go so this is also found in plenty uh, having uh, talked about i've just given you a, a birds eye view about Uh, all these uh, you know animal that is found uh, in, in betraganika uh, and this is just you know just to say about 10% of uh, uh, population of uh, you know a uh, 10 10 10% of the species diversity that you see there besides this you also have 
<clears throat> lots and lots of invertebrate crabs for example there are close to three species of uh, uh, you know dobi crabs or uh, yuca crabs we have ghost crab present you have mangrove crabs and so on and like that there are <clears throat> good polygate numbers there are uh, a lot of other uh, you know uh, lichen form uh, plants and there are associated plants found in mangrove area so uh, it's it's a beautiful environment but still uh, it is also threatened mainly because when development happens throughout the periphery then there's a lot of pressure inside people will try to come into gain access to come into the protected area so that issue is a big issue but uh, threats what i'm going to talk about now threats is common to all the mangroves in the country okay the first major threats that threat that we have is the habitat loss and degradation what has happened is that in we we have uh, you know kind of uh, in in the development is free what we have done is that uh, and for uh, development of industries we have gone into large scale aquaculture so and for aquaculture in the coastal area you require silty clay soil and the silty clay soil soil is found in very close to uh, river mouths and you know very close very very much in the mangrove areas so mangrove areas have been cut and they have been converted to aquaculture farms so this is a very common phenomenon we see throughout the country not just in india but also in entire southeast asia even sri lanka bangladesh pakistan everywhere and that is a major problem okay this is a severe habitat loss and habitat degradation habitat loss means the animal which lives there has to find a different place or has to totally get extinct from the uh, from the locality okay and then the degradation the degradation is that once you cut and trim it you know uh, denude the mangroves then you see that for them to grow back it takes you know many many years and uh, revert reversing back to the original condition becomes very difficult second thing that we see is that over exploitation see mangroves is also very good for fishery it's a nursing ground it's a nursery ground for fin fish and shellfish so in the nursery you see that what happens is that if you use uh, fishing gears or fishing uh, you know uh, nets that are uh, which are not eco friendly which are having less mesh sizes then they totally degrade the, the bed at the same time they also uh, catch lot of non target fishes okay and that is what is told here in the third point okay so non target fishery that happens with destructive nets in the mangrove uh, areas and also in off mangrove area, into the deep waters where you see that non target fishery and discuss take years <clears throat> this big industry is a very systematic industry and uh, the bottom trawling happens unfortunately 15 to 20% of the catch only is the catch that is used for consumption or commercial value the remaining 70 80% totally goes as waste and now even the waste is being collected for fish meal industry where they make uh, poultry feeds and you know other kind of aquaculture related products so there you see that there's a problem with that then we have issues with habitat displacement uh, habitat displacement basically to you know to uh, this is this is a case where you see that the animal does not is like you know i am being chased out of my house somewhere else and i don't i don't have a place to stay anywhere like that's a kind of situation so when animals move out from the habitat then they go to different habitat or an overlapping habitat where some other group of animals or a higher predator is there so chance of them to get killed as prey <laughs> chance of them to have been you know displaced is very very high and then we have encroachment so aquaculture is one part we have another encroachment encroachment like you know certain places of mangroves you see that they have been converted for ecotourism areas okay in name of tourism okay we will also be seeing little bit of unregulated tourism but maybe i can couple both together now see uh, what happens is that to attract more people for wildlife tourism a uh, lot of licenses were given bluntly okay and some and uh, some licenses were without even you know the government permission or the state's permission or the department permission it just came up so this all resulted in a lot of encroachments and now slowly government has realized the forest departments have realized that this is more than the carrying capacity and now they are slowly evicting one by one and they are trying to bring back everything to normal this is not the case only for the mangroves this happens even in nilgiris also happens throughout the country everywhere you see that in the name of uh, hotels and uh, safaris wildlife safaris you know this kind of uh, problem happens but uh, the major threat that we have is pollution which is a very hidden issue okay pollution you can see pollutants uh, you, you probably in a uh, developed city you can see the kind of sewage going in the effluent released from uh, uh, factories and industries all mixing up and coming together but uh, you also see that there is always a uh, a level which uh, you know uh, which goes unseen and that that happens in history whatever you do right on top of the stream mining uh, you know some kind of a, a mining activity there that will bring a lot of nutrients which which come and eutrophic eutrophicate the entire coastal waters
there are also issues where you know uh, other pollutants like for example people visiting uh, bitrakanika you know i'll just show the next slide uh, maybe i suppose i could not find it here you see that here and this is what was collected in mangrove area okay we collected some uh, because one team in our office works with marine debris and microplastics and a lot of good publications they have and you can see how much of plastic gets finally from the rivers everything gets trapped in the mangrove area and that causes a serious threat to environment this is a dangerous solid pollution solid waste you know that is uh, accumulating and we also try to work on uh, species caught in estuarine area and we try to check their uh gut content interestingly we found different kinds of plastics okay so which means that whatever man has devised in terms of convenience is now slowly coming back to us and uh, this these microplastics have a lot of dioxins and uh, we know that dioxins are present in almost uh, the cow's milk and even some breast milk of mothers so that's a kind of situation we are in okay so uh, pollution can come to any level so i just touched this point because of the pollution and uh, here you see that this is how the degradation happened this is uh, four places this is in uh, shivrajpur in uh, uh, i mean this is in gujarat i think and this is uh, from uh, west bengal in a uh, place called diga shankarpur this is sagar island see how the mangroves are cleared so that the road developments can come and uh, you know bunds can be made different construction activities can happen so there's a lot of clearing happening throughout the country and uh, this has to be kept in check that as it being major issue of degradation okay and again these are uh, plantation initiatives which you find in a place called junput in west bengal uh, where they have gone for large scale plantation of mangroves you can see this is the mangrove periphery buffer and see is just behind that and uh, you can see the plantation initiatives there right okay so finally uh, what i would like to just tell you is that now it is a time that we don't conserve one animal in the entire area now in 2018 uh, jaika japanese government they gave to the orissa forest department our institution to do a work and uh, we had an approach of ecosystem based conservation management plan for the entire uh, park area okay interestingly we have a uh, bitrakanika marine national park we have bitrakanika wildlife sanctuary we have gadhirmada uh, marine turtle conservation and there are uh, and there also it's a critically vulnerable coastal area so the entire Uh, bitrakanika orissa itself is uh, it's got four important uh, legal entities uh, wildlife sanctuary uh, national park a marine sanctuary and the critical vulnerable coastal area so four important systems found in one particular locality that tells you why it is very important in tamil nadu you see that kalfabana biosphere reserve is there and kalfabana marine national park are there two different entity legal entities are there that's mainly because of the uh, importance and uh, in terms of biodiversity in terms of economic returns they bring us ecosystem goods and services okay so that's why now the concept has come where instead of protecting one animal the entire ecosystem is protected right and these are the key drivers for the ecosystem plan first thing is to identify the ecological values and pressures what are the ecological values for ecological values you can go into the tbs uh, uh, evaluation of the ecosystem goods and services based on that you'll have Uh, the, uh, the value of one acre of land, how much economically it can be converted, is is uh, obtainable. And then second thing is that most of the study that we have to carry out should be long term, because in the short term it's very difficult to convey anything for a temporary management. So there should be a, a, a management plan, a short term management plan, and long term management plan. That will be very important for the monitoring. And from the monitoring, we can prepare a lot of interesting stuff. and then you see that we can also identify what are the stresses in the environment it can be anthropogenic stress it can be natural stress it can be stress from communities and so on that can be found out and what kind of intervention can be planned how well can we give a solution and what recommendation can go into is very very important when you make management plan and the other thing is that the so tourism is very important because uh, tourism gives a lot of revenue for the local community uh, for that we must have a good integrated networking and uh, the, the the community has to go uh, the community and the forest department or any other uh, department the legal framework they have to work together they have to work together and make sure that the uh, how many tourists can come inside per day that's called as ecological and tourism and ecological carrying capacity so based on number of footfalls how many people can come per day can be calculated and then the most important thing is the ecosystem health report card that we have very recently done for many places and which we do with uh, a new state we have collaboration with another institution in the us so what we do just like the report card that we have for exams we prepare ecosystem health card this report card will tell the current situation 2018 how it was 
water quality, fisheries, uh, crocodile population, other biodiversity, fishing pressure, aquaculture, everything will come into consideration. Then after 2020, they'll do again one more time and see whether there is an increase in conservation, increase in biodiversity or a decrease. So based on that, the scores keep changing. So the ecosystem and throughput cards are very important nowadays. And all of these things have to come together into a conservation management plan, which is very, very important. Now there is no conservation initiative without the presence of community. Community has to be, it is an hand-holding activity where forest departments, state planners, environmental planners, architects, and local community all have to come together and make sure that the entire uh, management plan is for the environment, not for any individual's uh, gain. Okay, and that's that leads to the capacity building. So we have to have different uh, training programs at different levels for the forest officers, for the line officers like uh, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, guards, uh, forest guards, like for range officers, uh, for uh, you know other uh, anti-poaching watchers and so on. And then at different for community, different kind of training for scientists, different kind of training for research, academicians, different kind of training for uh, journalists, other people, different kind of because this has to be a total uh, com combined oh. act with all the other uh, uh, you know kind of activities that I mentioned here. Okay, so this will give rise to the uh, ecosystem-based conservation management plan. And that will help in the long term for a better managed system. So thank you, and uh, I'm sorry for making you wait uh, because of this. Uh, I mean, I never expected that Thandi director is going to call. I told him I'm on a meeting. He just came to, you know, he just told come and put sign and go. So I just went there, signed, and came back. It was a little far away building. I had to rush back because my I was logged into this system. So thank you very much for your patient listening, and hope it was uh, informative. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. The trees and canopy provide a habitat for insects, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Mangrove trunks and roots hanging in water along creeks and inlets are home to a variety of branchlets, bivalves, and snails. Thank you, sir. We have enjoyed this session, your mind-blowing and inspirational speech. Thank you so much, sir. Now it's time for discussion. I request participants to post yeah. your queries in chat box. Uma, ma is there any questions, ma'am? Yeah, uh, there is a question from uh, Rubashri Third Year Zoology. Yeah. What are the threats faced by mangrove associated wildlife? Threats. Uh, yes, as, I uh, in, as I mentioned in the slide, there are many. Uh, see, for Bedraganika, the example I gave you, there it's protected. So basically, unprotected areas, there are many more. Okay, we call it mangrove patches and uh, uh, we have done the entire mapping for the uh, entire country and uh, we call them equal sensitive areas. There are, you see the CRZ 2019 notification, there are 11 important equal sensitive areas of which mangrove is one. And uh, in that we found there are many areas outside the protected areas within the country, either in the form of wildlife sanctuaries or marine national parks uh, or even communi community based uh, uh, areas and so on. So the major threat is development. Right, and uh, you see that aquaculture in the mangrove area is a major issue. That's the first major issue that we have. And uh, certain places we have uh, uh, illegal fishing nets. Uh, that is some practice. So these two are major threats for mangroves. Uh, failing of mangroves for aquaculture development and also illegal fishing activities that are present. And okay. in, in case if there are any industries which are nearby developed for Enur, for example, you see that lots of fly ash goes into the uh, mangrove area. A lot of mangrove has been cleared for the development of uh, indoor power plant too. So we have lost a lot of mangroves. So for that, they have to plant, they must do a compensation planting first. And then only they must take the dig, uh, remove the mangroves. There are certain uh, rules available, but uh, I mean, uh, very difficult to follow the rules. So these two are the major threats, uh, aquaculture and, uh, you know, illegal fishing activities. Thank you, sir, for your very good explanation. We have one more question yes, from Neela. What are the efforts made to protect and conserve mangroves in par with other countries? 
uh, india is much better uh, in terms of other uh, uh, east asian countries uh, because uh, mangroves are protected now under eco sensitive area so uh, there will be stricter act- actions and stringent measures taken of course in the protected area you cannot do anything it's an offense you cannot even go inside uh, certain wildlife areas the local community are allowed to go and harvest certain things i think uh, uh, buminathan sir is a, uh, he can give a very clear idea because you know in the western ghats the local community are allowed to go and collect because they use traditional medicine and uh, they uh, they do traditional harvesting and so on so i at the moment the crz 2019 notification please read the no- download notification read the notification that has given a good status for mangroves mangroves out of the 11 it's ranked one eco sensitive area so that is a very important uh, uh, step taken by the government uh, to get a kind of protect okay sir thank you sir Welcome, there's one more one more question from pratika yes, kalayar sir how is the life of wildlife and mangrove bound together what are the factors that govern them sir see as a as you saw in the presentation once you give the habitat right if 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 i don't have a house if i don't have a house if i roam about right i don't have any web settle down but if i have a house i just come to the, uh, come inside and stay there i have a specific place i try to make it well i have a boundary and so on but what has happened is that this house is not available the habitat is not available so when you conserve the mangroves protect them and keep them you know in pristine conditions then you see automatically wildlife you know, increases so that's why i said now it was protecting first the tiger protecting then the entire habitat will go now the concept has become where ecosystem or the habitat is protected then you see that all the associated groups all of them try to kind of uh, grow in numbers and the biodiversity enhancement is there the ecosystem or the habitat become very healthy okay sir then i have a question sir, from my sir. side sir yes ma'am uh, sir uh, uh, students who do bsc zoology they have yes, a uh, lot of questions like uh, what area they should go for their higher studies and what did you what did it motivate uh, you to choose this area sir yes ma'am see first thing was that ma'am can you uh, just tell the students yeah, yeah. that they have so many areas where they can go and do their higher studies uh, i mean the the entire see zoology is the right choice if you do bsc microbiology or bsc biotechnology you are stranded you are just one place Okay. Yes. BSc Zoology gives you a diversity of scope available. You can be anything. You can be a wildlife biologist like me. Others. You can be a marine biologist like me. Right? There is a lot of scope. I mean, uh, there are lots and lots of programs. Like you can be a marine biogeochemist. You can be a pollution toxicologist. You can be a uh, marine. Uh, you know, you can be a fishery specialist. So the scope is plenty. And ocean is like you know, it's like a treasure house. Like a treasure house. There's so much of uh, you know. Uh, a uh, species uh, available and so much of study to be done so on so my uh, interest to be a marine biologist was right from my younger days because uh, i used to have a lot of aquarium at home my father though is a physics man he used to always love nature i used to go on nature trails and nature treks with my father and uh, after my bsc i got a scholarship from uh, british columbia so i went to maldives to get underwater training and then i started to work on the fishes that made give me the interest to do marine science and uh, i did marine biology very close to in parangipet Okay, MSc 99, 97, 99 was the time, in, um, and the Kerala was my route every day, every time when I used to go home to Ch- come oh. from Chennai. So Chennai. that made interest, and from there there was no stopping. After that, I just kept moving on. That's it. Okay, sir. Very good explanation, sir. Thank, uh, you, thank sir. you, sir. Thank I have one so more thing, sir. Ask yes. being an institution for girls. How far is it safe for girls to take uh, areas like this and do higher studies and research and something like that? Ma'am, I, yeah. I, 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 I have two. project staff of mine who teach diving to me scuba diving okay i have two excellent trained lady staff okay youngsters one is 26 and one is 30 36 okay, okay. sir they are scuba divers see there is no difference between uh, you know uh, boy or a girl or a man or a woman nothing like that it's it's equal field and in fact okay. i would say that girls have better hands you know it's we our hands are very clumsy we when you start doing anything you know we do you know everything haste but whereas uh, the mm-hmm. ladies mm-hmm. have any feedback link mm-hmm. anupla ninga na ungalku message anupinga parala anupunga na wait pandren we have very safe whatsapp la anupa anupita please send the feedback na and whatsapp ku anupunga enak sumalatha madam sir paste it irukanga pa so you have a, you have a very good hand and i'm i'm sure that you will be able to excel very well okay sir thank you so much sir it was okay, a very good on. presentation we all liked it so much no. thank you so much uh, one more question from aswin yes. pradeep sir Yes, what ma'am. is carbon sequestration in tamil terms 
in sorry in simple uh, terms and what are the role played by moef and cc in mangrove conservation okay uh, first thing uh, i am a hybrid so my tamil is not good okay my father is from kerala my mother is from andhra i was raised in tamil nadu and i was waiting when i leave tamil so i did french throughout okay but uh, tamil la vandu carbon sequestration i can uh, get back to him i i do not know the exact term. Uh, i can probably ask some of my colleagues who for well was they know okay uh, see the amount of carbon in the atmosphere uh, like carbon dioxide you no know, for all the greenhouse gases a varumbod carbon dioxide carbon they all go and make a blank, blanket trap and you see that it does not allow uh, it does not allow the exchange to take place and uh, the radiation does not go out that's why the global warming happens okay uh, carbon sequestration means the carbon is found excess this gets trapped it gets trapped in different under the soil on surface soil and within the plant vegetation so the you know the plants always they take in oxygen i um, mean take in uh, carbon dioxide give out oxygen right so they are healthy they give us healthy environments so these mangoes everything they they trap carbon not only uh, trap carbon give oxygen they also trap it put under the soil so that it can minimize the effect on the environment this in simple term but this is a role of a, a, a biogeochemist they are specific scientists who work on the biogeochemist and they go into all calculations which i am not for Okay, I mean, I do not know this calculations, but this in general, and the role of MOFCC is that anything on the environment, there are different departments. Our institutions basically for coastal, anything happen in the coast, underwater, above the water, on the coastal areas, mangrove, salt marsh, uh, seagrass beds, corals, all is come under our purview. We we say how much status is there, and we and we also uh, give the number of uh, every year how much is every year every alternate year how is the uh, number of. The species that have gone up or gone down and so on. So that's the role we play. MFCs. MFCs plays that role: protection, conservation, and we also to enhance better livelihood opportunities. Yeah, I hope I have answered the question. I think Kavita, my ma'am, was the one who asked that question. Ah. Uh, hope I yeah. answered the question, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Most welcome, ma'am. thank you sir both of you have clarified all the queries raised by our participants i hope all enjoyed this session and with this let we move on to formal vote of thanks before that i request all the participants to fill the feedback form which is posted in the chat box now i welcome dr anit you anita assistant professor of zoology department to deliver your vote of thanks okay am i audible ma'am Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, you can. Ah, you are audible, ma'am. You take okay. carry on. Okay, ma'am. Very good afternoon to all. The essence of all beautiful art is gratitude, and because of our department, I take this opportunity to propose vote of thanks to our chief guest, Mr. Bhumi Nathan, for her wonderful presentation on wildlife and their habitats in Tamil Nadu. Thank you, sir, for your very interesting and lively presentation. It took us to the forest, and we all had very good time with animals. I express my sincere and heartfelt thanks to our speaker of second session, Dr. B. Deepak Samuel, for his valuable talk on mangrove associated wildlife. Thank you, sir, for your beautiful presentation of the topic. I am grateful to Dr. K. Mullai. assistant professor and head department of zoology and the principal in charge of our college for her constant support and encouragement words are powerless to express my gratitude our highest appreciation goes to our librarian dr a andu jabamala for her goodness kindness and support from fair one i owe my sincere thanks to our icsc coordinator dr s janthi sophia assistant professor of chemistry IKC secretary Dr R Ramya assistant professor of chemistry Dr G Kavita assistant professor of economics Mrs K Kadambari assistant Pro professor and head department of chemistry and uh, Mrs Smalata associate professor and head department of computer science for the timely help rendered and making this things happen my sincere thanks goes to our staff members faculty members from other colleges and our dear students 
who participated in this webinar today once again thank you one and all for your cooperation and making this even a successful one thank you thank you madam thank you thank you thank you so much and all the very best for the next day tomorrow yeah thank you, thank you so much thank for joining us thank joining you, us sir thank sorry, you sir for both the research it's, yeah, okay, sorry. it's okay sir it's okay sir thank you sir god bless you bless you thanks bominadan sir thank you so much sir hello uma ma'am shall i start yeah, live yeah. streaming yes sir yes yes ma'am yes madam ah.